It's lovely having you join us this afternoon at the Sensory Odyssey Opening Symposium, organized on the occasion of the launch of our new exhibition, Sensory Odyssey into the Heart of Our Living World. The exhibition is a portal into our extraordinary living world, articulated through an immersive, multi-sensory voyage across some of the most inspiring natural environments. We're exceptionally delighted to be joined by the exhibition's creator, Monal Allen, as well as biodiversity advocates, Dr. Niu Mei Lin, Ling Su Kian, Dr. Liao Ziming, and who have been shaping the storytelling of the exhibition's education gallery, Discover Our Natures of Stories Together With Us. The first track of the symposium leans into their practices, research, insights and advocacy work to survey the incredible biodiversity of life on Earth, from the land to the sea to the sky, and also to consider perspectives on what environmental stewardship really means in a rapidly changing world. And as part of our collaboration with Conservation International to drive impact and positive change in the community, we are presenting their inaugural 10 for 0 awards in the second track of today's program to recognize the next generation of environmental youth leaders. It gives me great pleasure welcoming Adrian George, Director of Programs, Exhibitions and Museum Services for Open Remarks. Adrian, please. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the museum today and um, to our lovely art science cinema uh, and of course our opening symposium for the exhibition Sensory Policy into the heart of the living world. The exhibition is making its Asian premiere here and um, opens to the public today but it was conceived and created by the Paris-based Sensory Policy studio and their collaborators over a five-year period nearly two years of which was across the pandemic. Over 300 people were involved in making this exhibition, including naturalists, artists, curators, and this is getting some feedback already, um, curators, neuroscientists, set makers, filmmakers, sound and exhibition designers. The first iteration of the exhibition was presented at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris last year, where it attracted over 200,000 visitors across, across a successful eight-month period. <coughs> this new enhanced version has been brought to us through par our partner's base, Entertainment Asia, and is a fascinating mix of exhibition, nature documentary, multi-sensory awareness experience, and common art performance. But it's nature itself that takes center stage and the spotlight in this extraordinary sensory policy. Starting in the African savanna, visitors embark on a voyage of the senses and the imagination that will see them travel from a rainforest canopy in South America to the wide expanses of the Indian Ocean and onwards to the epic landscapes of Greenland. Through state-of-the-art technology, this exhibition gives visitors the rare opportunity to explore some of the world's most extraordinary natural environments, as well as the plants and animals that inhabit them, all in incredible detail and in ultra-high definition. Captivating scenes are presented in a series of seven immersive spaces featuring hyper-realistic 8K resolution projections, spatial audio, and unique sets that will engage and magnify visitors' experiences through their senses. Stunning original footage shot in locations around the world by a dedicated team of natural history filmmakers is presented alongside 360 degree ambient soundscapes, some of which were created by Academy Award winning composer Nicholas Decker. <coughs> All of this is combined with custom olfactory creations by international flavors and fragrances to form environments of sense immersion. There are new transition spaces connecting the different exhibition environments, which have been specially designed for our presentation here in Singapore. And the exhibition concludes with an entirely new gallery titled Discover Our Nature, Our Stories. 
In that gallery, visitors can learn about the flora and fauna they encountered in each of the exhibition chapters, as well as getting to know seven experts and advocates from Singapore who are spearheading conservation efforts here in our own region. Commissioned videos introduce us to N Park's Kartini Oman, who walks visitors through the vibrant, reintroduced grassland habitat of Jurong Lake Gardens. Tropical rainforest ecologist Dr. Sean Lum speaks passionately in his video about the incredible range of biodiversity that can be found in our largest remaining primary rainforest, Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. Urban beekeeper John Chong points out in his video why bees are essential in keeping us and our planet healthy. And Dr. Harry Vishnu, in his video, shares his research on the acoustics of melting glaciers and how this can help more accurately predict sea level rise, a major concern for us here in Singapore, which is being accelerated by global warming. Three more extraordinary environmental experts are here with us today to present and to answer your questions. We are delighted to have with us naturalist Dr. Yong Zi Ming, who we will hear from later, who debunks common misconceptions about bats and highlights how they form an important part of our native ecosystem. Autodidact mycologist Nusi Kett illuminates the many ways that fungi can help heal us and create a more sustainable future, while marine biologist Dr. Neo Mei Min, who we will meet very shortly, reveals the beauty and ecological significance of the endangered giant plants. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from all three of our experts today, and we're very grateful for the time they've committed to helping us bring Singapore into close dialogue with the seven environments of sensory cuisine. Drawing attention to the climate crisis and focusing on those whose work explores innovative environmental solutions has been an important aspect of Art Science Museum's agenda and exhibition making practice since it was born 12 years ago. Our building was one of the first in Southeast Asia to receive gold lead certification, an international standard for leadership in energy and environmental design. But we have reached a critical point now, where raising awareness is no longer enough. As an institution, we must also take positive action that will have real impact on the environment beyond the confines of our building. That is why springboarding of our long-standing relationship with the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF, we have developed a call to action. Sensory Odyssey culminates in, in an invitation to our visitors to participate in creating a collective installation of a mangrove forest. Mangroves being one of Asia's most important tree species. Visitors are invited to make a commitment to lifestyle changes that could have a real-world impact on the environment. Those promises, written on a small paper leaf, become part of this communal installation. As each visitor contributes to the growth of the mangrove tree in the gallery, Art Science Museum, through our partnership with WWF Singapore, will support the planting of mangrove trees in Sarawak, Malaysia, to effect real-world change. By the end of the exhibition in October this year, we expect to have planted around 20,000 new mangrove trees. Today's symposium is organized in conjunction with the launch of Sensory Odyssey, with the aim of exploring different approaches to environmental stewardship and conservation in what is a rapidly changing world. As Sin mentioned, the first track of today's program features presentations by the creator of the exhibition and CEO of Sensory Odyssey Studio, Renal Allen, as well as some of our local scientists who are featured in the exhibition. The second half of our program today will highlight the work of young sustainability leaders in Singapore. To drive impact and inspire positive change, Marina Bay Sands has collaborated with Conservation International on the 10 for Zero Awards. The awards spotlight 10 of the brightest environmental youth leaders in Singapore who are advocating for a future of zero waste 
and net zero carbon emissions. You will be meeting these inspiring young leaders and our colleagues from Conservation International later today. So before I hand back over to our curator of public programs, Sim, to get started, I wanted to let you know about a slate of education activities that accompany the Sensory Odyssey exhibition. We have programmed workshops, talks, guided walks with local nature advocates, and drop-in activities at the museum, as well as a curated film program titled Wandering Wild that we have just seen in the cinema. We have our project with our art science in residence, Cesar Herada, continuing with a series of workshops on ocean imagineering. And later this year, with our colleagues in Marina Bay Sands Sustainability Team, we will host a further series of events and activities in the museum. So please do keep your eyes peeled for these projects and check online for full details. So all that is left for me to do now is to thank you for your time and attention to extend a warm welcome to our speakers today and to hand back to Sim to kick off today's proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian, for starting the program so beautifully. Our first speaker, Manuel Allen, is the CEO and co-founder of Sensory Odyssey Studio. Um, it's a transdisciplinary collective that creates innovative, multimedia and educational, location-based experiences that are designed to generate through sensorial and wordless journeys a feeling of belonging and resonance with the living world. And since Quenel's Cirque du Soleil debut in the 80s, his creative journey over the last 30 years saw him devising, managing, and producing a mix of spectacles around the world. Quenel will lift the curtain and talk about the making of Sensory Odyssey as a cross-disciplinary project that resides at the crossroads of natural history, neuroscience, and media arts created by a team of more than 300 people. Quenel, please. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Art Science Museum. Thank you, Singapore, for having us here today. We could not imagine a better place than here to plant the seed of this very different experience, which needed a very different kind of museum to grow in. So, as you've heard from uh, the, the presentation from Adrian uh, and from Sin, Century Odyssey. This is, is a very young, uh, growing company. Uh, in its current form, the current form is the, the genesis of what we would call a new form of edutainment storytelling. We like to call them awareness experiences as well, just to kind of be different from the um, usual immersive experiences that we see everywhere in the world. With uh, Sensory, we try to creatively explore hybrid techniques and technologies and capture and stage through original, it's very important that it's understand that it's, everything is original, all our, our films, our sounds, the sense, a lot of the, the technologies as well and the software and all of these other forms of sensory stimulation to tell all inspiring stories, emotions, to show the, the extraordinary feats and the perceptible interconnections that unite us, human animals, to all of Earth's biodiversity. In this experience, there are no words, nothing to read, just sensations. 
And those sensations are based on the idea of amplifying the power of vision, the power of hearing, of smelling, just to be able to change for a second our perspective and adopt that of other species. Obviously, we don't do it literally, but we, we try to kind of inspire from those other perspectives to induce them in the, in the visitors. All of the contents are filmed in up to 8K resolution. Hyperrealism is a key factor in, 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 in conveying the emotions, uh, we believe, uh, much more than CGI can do in our case. Uh, we have worked with a very specialized documentary film team, so uh, every, every content was produced by a specific team specialized in whales and insects, soil, uh, on Amazon, etc. etc. And as you've heard, they've been, we've sent them across Africa, South America, the Pacific, the far north, and France, and all of this during the pandemic. Um, it, made our work, it made our work extremely difficult because traveling was just about impossible. So, into the heart of the, our, our living world is the result of an original co-production with the Nat National Museum of Natural History in France, in Paris. And we developed their proof of concept version, an 800 square meter, eight month long proof of concept version, uh, which opened just at the end of COVID. In early 2000, in late 2021, uh, in this experimental phase, we aspire to develop a higher standard of immersive and entertainment visitor experiences on the theme of nature, but to foster awareness, a feeling of belonging to nature, by designing embodied and wellness ex experiences of wonder and awe, enchant, instruct, sensitize large audiences. People that don't necessarily go to see documentaries or go to museums, read the books. It is those people that we're addressing this experience to. And, and therefore conveying messages of, about natural sciences and about sustainable development made very accessible uh, to all. No one, no one else apparently has thought of doing this before us in the world of immersive entertainment, so we're quite proud of being uh, a leader in the market. Mission accomplished at the Natural History Museum. Over a third of the visitors had never set foot there out of the quarter million visitors that came to experience us. As Adrian was saying, years of trial and error before we could actually go into production. Um, museology, exhibition design, film production development, interactive engineering, live entertainment, neurosciences, natural sciences, you name it, anybody that had a great idea was put together and been brought in to, to, to create this with us. Now the version we're presenting here in Singapore, opening today, was enhanced, was not, is not exactly the same as what we had in Paris. It's been enhanced with some theatrical staging techniques, because we didn't have time in, in Paris to do it with everything we had in mind originally. And still, in fact, what we have here today is going to evolve for years and years to come. All of the multimedia and sensory contents, contents in this experience are all synchronized by a very sophisticated shock control system. So the lighting effects, the sound effects, the scent effects are all synchronized together. So it's really, um, it's like you're walking inside a film itself and that you feel the film is actually reacting to who you are and where you are. That way we're creating the feeling of embarking on a, on a quest, kind of a quest. We like to compare it to um, like Alice exploring the land of Darwin. Uh, that Alice is the public that is magically transformed and Darwin would be the science and nature. In this way, we could explore the more than human world directly. Like very intimately, intuitively, through our magnified senses to hear, to smell, to see, to feel nature like never and like never before, and also to discover that nature and imagination is pretty much the same thing. Nature is imagination. You cannot have greater imagination than nature. A maze, a giant maze, over twelve hundred square meters, made of seven habitats with multimeter contents, each linked by a mysterious passages of light and sound effects that we inspired, that we that were inspired by the elements of nature. Fire, earth, water, air, 
essentially between the habitats, we've created light and sound, artistic installations, that are kind of abstract, and that give us a break from the very high density multimedia content and have something that's just kind of a, an imaginary experience inspired by those, by the elements. We also added to this production a narrative journey, which consists of a transformational process. You basically feel like you're changing scale to the size of an ant or to the size of a wall. Puts you in a dreamlike state by starting with a kind of a hypnotizing initiate passage, initiation passage, and ending with an experience of awakening. Now, probably the most important and the most novel of the ingredients to this experience is set. We, uh, we decided early on in the beginning of this project that we needed to include scent because it's the most powerful trigger of emotions and memory, the universal language that directly links us to our animal state. And it acts like a travel machine. There's about 20 or so scents, and, and this, this adds very much to the experience of embodiment. The scents were curated, designed, and produced by IFF, International Flavors and Fragrances, without whom we would not have been able to uh, make this uh, pioneering work happen. We also have a very cutting edge bioacoustic soundscape and ambisonic like lighting effects that are designed to amplify the feeling of immersion and creating kind of multi sensory and cognitive illusions to stimulate imagination. Imagination is a very big part. We need people to kind of, you cannot just give them the reality, you also have to spark their imagination so they do part of the work or else they don't feel engaged. The technologies, the multiple technologies used to capture or to stage these contents, they're all very cutting edge because we need to have hyper-realistic effect, but they're invisible and concealed to serve their only purpose widen our vision, change our perception, expand the scope of our attention, generate a feeling of magical resonance. An example of how tech and science, this is an example of how tech and science can be part of a communal process to widen our vision and expand, uh, sorry, of a, um, sorry, a communal process to widen our vision and expand the scope of our attention. We also found a lot of inspiration in recent neuroscientific research exploring the, the degree to which emotions of awe and wonder, as opposed to fear and guilt, immediately enhance our cognitive abilities. When we're in a state of wellness, our capacity to learn, our capacity, our curiosity, our capacity to act is amplified. It also harvests a sense of humility, of empathy and care. In fact, in Paris, we conducted a small cognitive research program with a few dozen volunteers um, at the museum. Uh, by collecting the biosignals through uh, 10 different types of sensors. And this way we were able to kind of measure the emotional feedback uh, along with questionnaires and realize that they've had a substantial impact on their cardiac, cerebral, respiratory, and electrodermal activity, favorable to being much more receptive to the experience. Uh, we believe that embodied type sensory experiences make it easier also to rewild by, re by raising our awareness of what we sense in our bodies. To then naturally be inclined to rewild the world, we believe that if people don't feel uh, the world in, the, in them, they cannot act uh, in favor of the world. So. This way, through this experiment, we hope to uh, help the visitors better understand their emotions, their physical emotions, their behaviors, their needs, and all of those other things we share with the non-human world and care for it. We also, in the end, over time, strive to leave behind a legacy uh, of all of these uh, parts of the world of biodiversity for future generations, but also for today so they can experience themselves more intimately, more directly, nature as it feels, uh, more than on a television documentary, at least. Um, so, we are... Um, I would like to um, 
go from the theory now to the practice. I've uh, uh, discussed and presented a lot of our ideas that were behind the project. Uh, now, what we've done here in, in Singapore is the first uh, is the first uh, um, experience of it, and I'm uh, I would like to invite you to. Um, uh, we're going to watch a few images, uh, and I'm going to kind of uh, walk you through the experience with us. Visitors start by entering a time and space machine, a uh, travel machine. The idea here is to transfer through sound and light, uh, bring you to a state of your human mind and to your, your animal body. Simply trying to kind of hypnotize you, present, put you in a, in, a, in, a, in a position where, like Alice falling into a tunnel, with the sound effects amplifying, literally amplifying, giving you the feeling that you're falling. Uh, one of the examples of the marvelous work of Nicholas Becker, the sound designer. As you walk to the end of this tunnel, you will enter the first, the first habitat, the habitat which is the savanna in the night time. Here, the animals, many, many animals, are gathering around a pond. It's night. You don't see anything, or you hardly see anything, but you smell and you hear. This way we are preparing visitors for a journey where sight is, uh, is diminished in order to enhance your other, uh, your other senses and prepare better for your journey. Uh, around you, in 360 degrees, different animals, lions, elephants, um, zebras, giraffe, etc., are coming one by one to, to, uh, to drink, to quest their thirst. And you feel just like one of them. It is purposely a may designed in this room to be a bit unfamiliar, a bit strange, make people feel a bit uneasy. Uh, because we also feel that if we don't lose, if we don't, uh, this, is, this is where theater comes in. If you don't in the beginning kind of destabilize the public, then they will just stay on the automatic pilot. In this, first, in this first instance, there's a chance to suddenly, for three and a half minutes, you kind of have to think, oh, you know, you have to adapt, like other animals have to adapt. There's a thunderstorm building up through sound and lightning effects, and suddenly the thunder hits, lightning hits, smell of fire, all of the animals run away, and it's time for you to, to go on your journey and, 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 and go to safety. You will, be, you will walk through the oxygen passage. In the oxygen passage towards the next room, you are going to have the experience of photosynthesis. Again, sound and light effects. That you will hear plants growing as if you were a small microscopic being listening to the, to the, to the growth of plants in time in, in, in a, um, class track, uh, sorry, in, what's the word, time lapse. So you are essentially feeling like you yourself are, uh, are experimenting the biological phenomena of photosynthesis, uh, walking through the cloud. As you get into the next room, you are entering the rainforest where the canopy suddenly, the sensory odyssey allows you to be at the right place at the right time, and have the right senses to perceive that everything that's going on. So now you're in the rainforest, high up in the canopy, 40 meters above, 360 degree film, and in a very high definition. And you will begin a descent amongst the trees and explore all of the animals that appear on their way uh, while you're smelling the vegetation. Uh, the green vegetation, as you get closer to the ground, you smell, you smell the moist of the, of the ground and the moss. This, uh, the technology here in actually filming the 40 meter descent, cabling those cameras in a way that was going to offer a very smooth, continuous descent to avoid making the audience dizzy, uh, was, was quite a feat in itself. It was also done in ten, over 10 days of rainy conditions. Um, which were, um, and after having to change locations four times prior to doing this in Guyana, we were supposed to do it in Peru and then in Brazil, but every time because of COVID we had to shift our, uh, our, uh, uh, our, our travel schedule. 
Um, so it was, it, was, it was one of the many Mission Impossibles. At the end of this, um, at the end of this uh, story, of this uh, journey, the same room will transform itself and you will, you will find yourself to be in the night, in a, in a, in a, in a forest, uh, in a continental forest, and you will be experiencing echolocation by bats. How do bats fly in the night blind? They use echolocation. They send out ultrasounds. Uh, and the ultrasounds are represented in this, in this, in this room visually, you see how the ultrasounds travel through space and hit upon rocks and trees and allow them to identify where their prey, the, the mosquitoes, the bugs, the big meats are. And it's very, very fast. So for a few minutes, you're literally suddenly you have the power to experience what it's like to have echolocation. It's kind of fun. And it's maybe it's one of the it's kind of the psychedelic uh, part of our experience. It's not as realistic as the other ones, but the emotions and sensations are realistic. At the end of this, uh, of this yet extraordinary journey, you're going to embark on something that no human has ever experienced before. You're going to, you're going to crawl under Earth. Uh, you walk into the dark Earth corridor. You are literally walking under the roots of the, uh, of the earth, you're hearing the, all of the insects scratching, you're like a worm that's making its way under the earth, and you will find the underground room. Underground three meters will this bring you to the, the place where humans would never go. Imagine, imagine you're just, you are yourself a, a, a crawling worm, under this, under this, under this, under the soil. In the soil here, over 20 meters of, of, of screen, and four meters high, you will discover an extraordinary world of microscopic beings, of uh, moles, of ants, of electrical chemical currents happening amongst the mycelium, the roots. You will hear all of the life. Uh, that is, that is, that is, and, and, and be amazed at how rich, how dense uh, the activity uh, of the underworld is, uh, and which we depend on for all of the plants and species that live above, above, the, above the ground. A passionate sense of storytelling for the infinite complexity and richness of all life on the ground. Once you've had enough of the smell of soil and mushrooms and the darkness of the underground, you are free to walk, uh, on, you, you decide yourself you know, to continue your journey and you will walk back over the overground amongst the grass. Imagine you're a grasshopper. No. You take on the journey, you, you, you go towards the light, you have the sound of all of these insects around you as the grass stands tall, um, tall above you. And you enter the prairie room. In the prairie room, you will be discovering uh, a very, very uh, uh, extraordinary world of insects. We have three great screens where we have filmed in over 1,000 images per second. Insects that have never been filmed portrait with such definition. Um, it's certainly probably the moment where uh, our audiences uh, have the greatest moment of, of surprise because you are going to experience pollination. How do flowers attract the, how do flowers use the sense, this extraordinary, very beautiful sense that will be attracting you, like the insects, into discovering the intimate world of plants and how pollination uh, happens, how it works. You will hear these, uh, these insects flying, walking, like it's never been possible to hear them. And you will feel part, you will, feel, uh, you will see the beauty of them in such detail, as tiny as the little hair on the cheek of a, of a, of a, of a, of a bee. Is, you, you just feel the joy, you, feel, you see the beauty that's never been Imagine 
um, even with the greatest designers or, or um, jewelers. I think what, what happens here is one of the most life-changing moments, I think, of our audiences. Because once they've seen the microscopic world of insects in this way, uh, and they walk into the little garden, they will never, ever, ever uh, look at it the same way again. And you're never going to want to stab and uh, uh, you know, put your foot on an ant or, or a spider. You will hear a spider make this spider web. So for the 15 minutes or so, you are exploring the world of insects. The first one are the flying pollinating insects, the second one are the microscopic insects, and the third are like portraits of insects such as this that you see in extraordinary detail. After the, uh, after the insect uh, uh, encounter, you will um, you invite it to go to the water passage. In the water passage, you will experience what it's like to be a, a, a drop of water that will become an ocean. Uh, walk 20 meters along this passage with the sound of water that intensifies and that either becomes the sound of plunging under the sea if the next room is the, the deep sea adventure or the Arctic if the next room is the Arctic Pole. Uh, the, the two programs in the last room were a very large room with a 180 degree screen 21 meters large and you are literally feeling the immensity of the world. The first experience of the sperm whales in Mauritius and we're joined here you see the whales swimming as if they were swimming just beside you in full size up to 21 meters large and these sperm whales are, are basically using the, the signals to look for each other in the, in the ocean. And as they convene, as they reunite, they, their clicks, their sounds start intensifying, and you can feel the emotion of their, of their as, as they, that they have as animals gathering the same we have, the same emotions. Yet another example of all of the things we share with every other species in the living world, as they caress each other, as they touch, or as they sleep. There was a tiny detail. A plastic bag made its way in the mouth of one of the sperm whales. We purposely left it in the images, though, generally speaking, we like to show the world as it should be. The fact that there is a detail that shows us the world as it is uh, does help suddenly uh, put even more value to, uh, to the other experiences you're having, which are not polluted by humans. After this uh, dance, and this plunging with the, with the sperm whales, the program will change into the Arctic and you will be magically sailing above, amongst, and underneath the icebergs of the far north in Greenland. We had three film teams, the, the drone team, the underwater team, and the uh, cinematic team. And uh, these and, and we're navigating amongst these icebergs. Probably the most memorable time of my life, most peaceful. We were very lucky at this time with COVID. Uh, there, were no, there was no one there, no boats to make sounds because we were recording everything ourselves. And sound can record things coming from thousands, from hundreds, tens of kilometers away. So we were very, very, very lucky to be there amongst the first and uh, to be able to record and sound and, and film these extraordinary monuments. Each iceberg is like a, is not only like an extraordinary sculpture, but they feel you feel like they have souls to themselves. They are really truly uh, immensely beautiful, and we and, and it's quite extraordinary to discover all the life forms we can, we, need, we find in here. Um, at the end of this uh, at the end of this journey, you will be um, invited to uh, finish your. Basically, to awaken, we have the awakening passage, and this awakening passage is a very feminine, very, very, very gentle moment. You're basically, after having fallen asleep in the first tunnel, the time and space tunnel, you are you are invited to not only awaken, but you feel like uh, we purposely uh, designed this room to be um, kind of like a rebirth experience. Imagine being in the womb of your mother. You hear her breathing. You hear her heartbeat. You hear her humming, 
and you're walking amongst this uh, these, um, fabric, very gentle fabric, and the pulsating light, and feeling like it's time to wake up, like the mother of Alice waking her up and saying, uh, come back to the world uh, as it is. And, uh, and we feel we, this way we finish our journey in a very, very um, precious, very precious, very tranquilizing moment. Uh, which leads us to the moment to learn, the discovery room. Uh, discover our nature, discover our stories. So in collaboration with the Art Science Museum, uh, they have inspired themselves uh, on the contents of our sensory audience experience to then um, present the different habitats that were the, the habitats, the species, uh, they were they were encountered on the way, and therefore, uh, having been sensitized, having been tranquilized, uh, people are we found that people are very much more prone to to, to learn, to, to to share, uh, and also to act. And this is where uh, the mangrove plant uh, tree growing also happens. Uh, again. Uh, in this space, after that experience, people are much more prone to doing something about what they've what they've learned than if they had just been presented directly with this kind of a um, uh, of an academic or a learning. Uh, and so, this is the uh, this is the end of this voyage. Uh, it's one of many. Uh, we hope that Singapore will allow us to continue our journey and continue inventing new stories. Uh, and I'm very keen to hearing our uh, friends today and how they will interpret what we have been doing and each one with their own scientific expertise and passion. And thank you all for listening. Uh, and, I hope, and I hope that you will enjoy the show when you have a chance to see it too. Um, thank you, Brunel. Bruno has described Sensory Odyssey as a new form of immersive naturalistic awareness experience and that the exhibition is created with the hope of renewing a sense of awe and empathy um, and nurturing the values that can better prepare us for the changes happening in the world. And in the final gallery of the exhibition, Discover Our Nature of Stories, it is shaped together with a wonderful community of scientists, researchers and advocates here in Singapore who are shaping a future where biodiversity is valued as an asset and as our natural heritage. We're delighted to have three of them in our space today who will be sharing their stories and stories of nature and our um, Dr. Neil Lee Lin is a marine biologist and senior research fellow at the National University of Singapore um, Tropical Marine Science Institute. Her research interests include the marine, the marine culture of marine invertebrates, experimental marine ecology, population genetics, and marine conservation. Maylin's fascination with the majestic and danger giant plants started during her undergraduate days, which then continued through her research. During her PhD, she also restarted Singapore's efforts in restocking giant plants back on our local reefs between 2011 and 2018. And Maylin continues to today work very closely with conservation, of, works very closely on the conservation and management of the giant plants in Southeast Asia. Um, this afternoon, Maylin will speak about how giant plants are flagship coral reef um, species and very important ecosystem engineers. And she'll share insights into how she and the team work with stakeholders to transplant cultured giant plants to Singapore leaves. Um, welcome, Lily. Thank you everyone for being here and uh, firstly I'd like to thank Sid, Pudin uh, and Art Science Museum for actually uh, inviting me and also making me a part of the exhibition. Really excited uh, to have brought my family just last Thursday for the preview and they truly really enjoyed the, the exhibition as well. So today I'm just going to do it in a slightly different way. I'm going to introduce Singapore's giant friend also. Who is she and what she does? 
So a little bit about myself, I am born, raised and educated completely in Singapore. So I did my bachelor's and my PhD uh, focused on marine ecology, which is basically the study of um, interactions of marine animals with the environment and vice versa as well. How does the environment also affect some of the animals? And um, over the last 15 years of, of work, I have been studying marine life living around in Singapore waters. And in particular, I am very keen in sharing my own research outcomes with different stakeholders, including agencies and public members, on how we can actually better conserve and manage endangered marine animals such as the giant plants. I'm also a very avid science communicator. I love talking about science. Uh, and the reason why I started communicating science is also because I wanted more people to know about the work that I do. Uh, and at home, I'm a mom of uh, uh, to, to, to one cat and two girls. You can see two of my little girls here as well. So, who is Giant Campbell and how did I actually get that nickname? So, Giant Campbell was coined in 2008 by uh, one of our local veteran and very passionate um, uh, advocate, uh, Ms. Ria Tan, who is the founder of Wild Singapore website. So it was my very first intertidal work trip um, to one of the southern islands in Singapore called Pulau Jong. And on that very trip, uh, I remember that before we actually got onto the seashore, she was saying that like she rarely sees giant cats in Singapore, they are actually quite hard to find. Um, and I'm not sure why you're doing a PhD about them. Because if you don't have enough animals in Singapore, how do you actually do, a, do research about them as well? Uh, and you know, quite, quite sort of serendipitously, we actually encountered one individual on this particular reef. Uh, and it, it was my very first wild giant plant sighting in Singapore. And I know, like, it, having was for a while studying them at that point in time. So people around me uh, during the trip itself were asking me, like, what is this? Like, you know what species this is? How old do you think this is? And you know, all sorts of questions just came flowing as we you know, converse on the reef together while looking at this very majestic animal. Uh, and then since then, nobody really actually calls me by my actual name. So, you know, but, so people, if you ask like, where's Nalen, probably people don't know, but if you ask them where's Giant Campbell, they probably know better. So when I tell others that I do marine science research um, as, you know, for, for a living, uh, I'm a marine biologist, they would go wow and they would think like, oh, do you actually spend a lot of time in your scuba diving gear and then do you actually jump into the big blue ocean and go up? So yes, I do a little bit of that uh, and unfortunately not really, not so much of big blue oceans around Singapore, it's actually a little bit sedimented and not so blue. Um, but I invite you to actually also come and visit and see our uh, seashores as well. So I get to do some of that, but most part of my research actually I spend a lot of time under the sun or rain uh, surveying um, the, the local quarries for you know, different marine animals, including the giant plants. Uh, and also, I collect some of these individuals back to our lab to actually do breeding, breeding work in the uh, breeding work and experiments. And I spend most of my time actually scrubbing and cleaning plants. So I actually squat in a tank, and you know, basically one of the photos right here, you can see, you know, back bending. Sorry, back bending with my student here. You, yeah, basically this is my posture uh, all the time in the lab. Uh, in fact, I tell a lot of my incoming students that like don't expect yourself to be like putting on like scuba diving gear. You actually gonna just be holding a toothbrush and scrubbing plants uh, for most part of your career. But like right now, um, you know, I talk a little bit about giant plants. You might be wondering like what exactly and how do they actually look like? So as its name suggests, uh, giant plants are the largest marine seashells in the ocean. The larger species can actually grow up to about one and a half meters long, which is you know not about my height. And I recently actually got an opportunity to meet meet these giants in Palau. Uh, and the, and they actually can weigh over three hundred kgs or even more as well. So you know one of the questions I get is like how many species there are there of giant plants uh, around the ocean? Uh, and I'll give you a very pin, which is basically the illustration that you see here. Um, basically represents each and every individual uh, that we have uh, that we are recognized right now. 
Uh, there are 12 different species. It's actually a very small family of giants, but they are actually quite critical and important to different quarries ecosystems depending on where they are found. They are very special as well. So we know a lot about corals, and we know that some of us, we know that corals have this very special relationship or they could photosynthesize. So giant also have that very same relationship with a very special photosynthetic algae that lives in their tissues. Just think of it like algae living under your skin. And it allows them to actually collect sunlight and photosynthesize, make food for themselves, and go to really large sizes. So can you imagine if I have if I can actually harvest or you know collect uh, algae under my skin, I probably don't have to eat very much, or I might grow very big uh, over time, but I don't have to start. I don't have to keep on finding food for myself. Um, but that's also one of the reasons or one of the hypotheses why these animals grow to such large sizes compared to some of the other clams that we've seen, like oysters, mussels, that you often find on your dining table. So because of this relationship that they need with the sunlight, they actually don't, uh, they can't, you can't find them very deep in the, uh, in the oceans, like you know, no more than 40 meters. Some individuals or some species can be 60 meters, but they are very special as well. Um, and that's also a reason why locally in Singapore, jackets are also not very common because of the clarity of our seawaters here. And you know, as large individuals, they actually don't move around very much. So they are what we call sessile and immobile, uh, which actually makes them very good indicators of the reef health condition. So you can always very easily go back to the same place to find them, or you can actually mark them out. Um, there are pros and cons to that. They are like little you know, beacons, or you know, you can think of them like canaries in the coal mine. You know, when something happens to them, you can actually get an idea of like how the environment is doing. And they are like what they are what I like to call ecosystem engineers. So please allow me to explain how they are come about to that as well. So during my PhD, I was studying them. So in fact, before my PhD, I started studying them as an undergraduate student. I spent a lot of time with them, and then you know, like when I started my PhD, and I started to ask myself like, why should people care about them? We know a lot about like why we need to conserve coralies, why we need to conserve big, large marine mammals and you know, charismatic animals like sharks and whales as well. But what about animals like this where you know, they don't look very charismatic, they don't have very big booty eyes that attract you, but they're very colourful when you actually get an opportunity to see them, they just sit around like couch potatoes, not doing very much like you know. But like, so that kind of got me on like, this journey of like trying to understand what kind of roles they have in the uh, in the habitats that they live in, uh, as well as also how they are important to people. So from an ecological perspective, they are essentially still food sources to a wide variety of different marine animals. Some very interesting animals that include like the triggerfish, um, the octopus would also like eat, eat them or eat the small ones. Um, you know, being so big as well and with really large shells, they actually serve as habitats of um, small micro refuges for small animals like corals, but also like sea cucumbers, beauty brain for sea slugs. Uh, you know, they will just like kind of congregate and gather around these like big clams. You can think of them like little HDBs. You know, also HDBs house a lot of us. So basically, they are like that as well. So they not only house people outside, but they also house animals inside their body as well. And essentially, they're like reef builders. I mean, like people don't think of them as um, you know built reefs, but they do because like they're one of the few animals that can actually build so much calcium carbonate uh, on their shells, which is essentially the foundation of reef, reef ecosystems as well. So from a you know human and uh, human perspective, the cultural uh, importance. They actually are traditionally eaten uh, or used in many of the local coastal communities, particularly in our region, Southeast Asia, and the wider region of the Asia Pacific as well. They are often harvested uh, as their food source also, but their shells are also being used as building materials uh, or even just like ornaments they are found around the house. So they are still often uh, fished out for domestic purposes, but they also have, uh, they also face some issues with commercial scale fishing in some of the countries. So one of the projects that sort of led me to is like sort of discovering different stories of how people connect 
themselves with trying to have like different stories, be it like you know from a food and subsistence perspective, but also how they have like some interesting beliefs. For instance, like in Palau, they actually believe like one of their creation story actually involves the the, the giant crab, where they believe that the um uh, the the, the goddess actually recruited the dragon clam as one of the first things that they created uh, in Palau, which actually sort of like gathered um, you know, the, the feeling of their children and, and sort of like the story about how Palau came about as well. And stories not just limit to places where we can find them, but stories also come from like the Middle East and Europe, where a lot of the previous um, Previous collectors from that, that sort of went to the region actually collected many of these shells, and you can actually for for some of you who have visited Europe or might have seen them in churches. That's also the reason why you see them so often. So these are like broadly what fascinated like many people in the past. But what really fascinated me about them is their babies. And their babies are so small. They're like full stop. Like maybe really the full stop they write on some paper. Um, and this is like a grown up version of them as well. So I'm not sure if you can see, you have to probably scrutinize or maybe wait for something happening right here in this cluster. So you can see them like kind of moving and nudging to each other. So one of the things that were really fascinated me when I was studying them is that they love to stick together and they love to move around very much, which is totally what we do want them to do. We want them to stay put so that we can monitor and track them. Or at least like make sure that they can grow well, but they just like to stick together. So the little ones at like no more than a you know a size no, no more than the size of a full stop loves moving around. And unfortunately they continue moving around a lot even as little little miniature versions of pants. So this is, so that kind of brought us to like a study that we did uh, or at least my, my team uh, and my research team at that time together with my supervisor. So this is a really like fast forward uh, video right here. It's an overnight footage. We did a time lapse, and you can sort of see them like kind of skittering around like little little bugs here and there. So what we did for this experiment, um, let me just replay this as well. Like cute this way. We lay them in rows and columns, and that's how we really like to hand them in when we want to like measure them and know how they do. But like just a matter of like couple of hours, they would actually just together like like bees coming in swarms and we were wondering why would they actually be walking to each other so firstly they, they can detect each other for an animal that doesn't have very obvious eyes they actually can see or sense each other through the chemical cues so I can smell my brother or sister right there so I would just move, it, move over there so that's the first part of the, of the study I we're wondering like why would they want to keep on sticking to each other because like sometimes the way that they stick to each other might not necessarily be very helpful on how they would grow. So we did a follow-up experiment but this time introducing a predator which is a crab right here. So what we did was we actually did two different sort of combinations. We would put them in uh, separately, like very dispersed with uh, spaces. But we also have them in a cluster like this. So we, if you think about it, like from the animal kingdom, there are some animal examples such as the wildebeest where they would gather together in big groups, especially when there's predators coming, like you get large lions and other animals as well. And you'll notice that there is actually protection within the middle cluster, in the middle of the cluster, compared to the periphery. So this is exactly what these little tiny dragons are doing as well. So when they are a lot younger, they will cluster together because they will look much bigger to a potential predator. That's one. And two is that like if a persistent predator such as the crab here, it will actually take the predator a lot longer time to try and unravel the entire cluster. So by the time it's like ready to eat one, I'm really tired. It will actually probably just abandon the cluster and leave. But if the cats are actually like found in sing single uh, spots, then that's highly likely that all the cats will be wiped out, which is what we saw in this particular experiment. So these are some of the work that we did in the lab. So bringing that forward to like um, what we understand about like the status of giant cats in Singapore, it's actually quite interesting. Like, I sort of went down a little bit of a history. Not, not just a natural history, but also looking at a little bit of archaeology. 
Um, so we actually got some um, researchers uh, from the archaeology department. They actually uncovered some giant clam shells from some of the excavation sites around Singapore, including the St Andrew's Cathedral Church um, at the uh, <laughs> area. So underneath the churches, uh, there are, they actually have lots of some of the shells, including the clams. Um, and we believe that like, when we actually unravel the very old maps, like between 1600 to 1800s, um, these were actually previous fishing villages, which may explain the presence of these shells. So later on in the 1900s, uh, we realized that there were lots of records that actually uh, you know, indicated very strong fishing activity so, uh, and shell collections as well. So these animals um, had an impact even at that time point where you know, maybe conservation wasn't something on their mind. Uh, and what's interesting is that Singapore was actually known as a famous shell collecting centre at that point in time. So moving forward to somewhere like you know, the late 90s and uh, up to today, uh, even though they are no longer fished out from our local waters, um, but because of the other ongoing impacts such as coastal development, uh, dredging, uh, and even actually the high shipping and maritime activities happening around our coastal waters, do have an impact on the, their general survival and growth. I talked about like how light is an issue uh, in our local waters. But what's also really um, interesting right now is that also in, from a regulation or from a law perspective, they are protected in Singapore. Although the other half of it is that if they are protected, but like, is there enough enforcement to make sure that some of our remaining individuals are not going to be fished out? So this is an overview of how many species we have. Uh, out of the 12, we have 5, but unfortunately today we only have 2 left. So the remaining 3 species, um, definitely 2 of them are locally extinct, which means that the species can no longer be found in Singapore since 50 years of its records. So you can see that like the last record was 1963 and this is 1866, so yeah, that's pretty long, probably more than 50 years. Uh, we only have two species left, uh, and the last species we are actually really not sure. So until today, we haven't found any individuals. So in a way, we're sort of waiting for the 50-year mark to actually formally record it as locally extinct. So we can see that our numbers are really low. So if some of you who are avid divers or snorkelers, like you know, visit Malaysia, really just next door, and have seen some of these animals, you know, you know that they are like, they can occur in hundreds. Uh, or thousands depending on the species. But right here in Singapore, we you know, have really few numbers of them. Uh, and this is the reason why there's that motivation for actually doing the breeding studies and also restocking uh, programs. So very broadly, like you know, they are there are actually conservation tools and approaches. So because their numbers have dropped so drastically, not just in Singapore but globally as well, there actually have been conscientious efforts and global spotlight on these animals. So the, the, the tool that is on top right here, um, well, the first one right here, we're actually looking at the, what we call a convention that looks after the International Wildlife Tree. So um, basically, this is looking after animals that are being imported and exported, uh, and you know they are regulated. So basically, any country or any party wants to bring animals, bring these animals into another country, they need to actually go through the paperwork and regulations and make sure that these individuals are actually cultured and not taken from the wild, which is something quite interesting for this group of animals. Most of the animals that you see in the wildlife trade or in the aquarium trade, um, they, they are not regulated except for corals and giant clams, which means that every sea star you see, every feather star you see, every sea cucumber you see, and every snail you see there are harvested from the wild with no regulations protecting their over harvesting or over collection. So fortunately for just these two groups of animals so far, um, they, they do have some regulations, but there are still some sort of like um, yeah, sort of like some animals that are illegally trafficked, uh, which we know that they're not supposed to be from the wild, but we still still see them from time to time. Then the other is basically also another international um, 
uh, like sort of a conservation program, which is we call the International Union for Conservation of Nature, in short IUCN. They basically have a red list of threatened species where, like you know, species that are potentially vulnerable, uh, particularly endangered, threatened, are all put into this list as a form of um, prioritization and informing different stakeholders, uh, you know, to use the information for their own local uh, context or local populations as well. So some of the ones that I talked about, uh, you know, from a little more local and regional perspective, would be and like laws and enforcement. So we have that right here in Singapore, but in most places, enforcement is usually an issue. So they can't quite have enough people going out there to stop the, the local fishermen from collecting or over collecting the individuals. I'll share a very quick story. So I was in Palau just last week, and I was there to actually do a research exchange. And I learned something really very interesting. So over there, they allow the export and sale of cultured giant clam individuals. And they are a huge hub for cultured giant clams, which is great. But what I found was a little bit um, concerning was that locally, the local communities can harvest as many wild giant clams as they like. There is no limit on the size, there's no, no limit on the species, there's no limit on individuals. So basically, if you encounter a big giant clam like this, if you can manage and you can carry it home, sure, you can do that. And that's something really quite concerning because even though on one hand they are culturing that, but we need to understand that like culturing um, reduces like you know the, the, a certain diversity in the individuals. They become very similar to each other through culture and breeding. So actually maintaining the wild population is still very critical and even though you know I I do see some of the individuals but it is still quite concerning that some of them are being taken without any kind of uh, laws regulating the collection. And finally I think one of the ones that I'd like to share a little bit more is how we do restocking and reintroducing the, the individuals that we cultivate. So in this project, I really regret that I didn't show like the, the pictures that I wanted to, but I just but here we actually I'm more like introducing the two different species that we still can find in Singapore. So these are the ones that we can still find in Singapore. This is what we call the fluted dry clam. Uh you know, because it has really beautiful fruits. Uh, and actually have this particular individual has really nice patterns as well. Um, and the other one we call the boring dry clam. Not because it's boring by nature, but more because of its habit and behavior. So what you're actually seeing is that this particular individual here is fully embedded in the rocks. So when we actually compare two of these species right here, people are more likely to take the one on this side, the bigger one. So it's not only because of its size, but because it's not buried in the rock. It's so much easier to actually just nick and pick them off straight away. And that's what's also happening in many places. And this particular species here, because it's so difficult to kick them out, we need a hammer, we need a chisel, we need a snorkel, we need a scoop the diving gear to just make sure that you are maintained below. So this species is actually doing really well in Palau, but the other species is really not. It's just because of the, the, the behavior and the difference uh, as well. So these are the two species that we're working right now. If you ever had the opportunity, I welcome you to my marine lab located uh, at St. John's Island. We do have some babies uh, of this species right now uh, that we're actually trying to perform additional experiment, experiments to understand their behavior also. So one of the things that I did, uh, have done, so uh, you know, going beyond my own PhD, which was very centered in Singapore, was how does my work uh, apply beyond the shores of Singapore? Uh, and I've done several different things. So I may seem like traveling the globe uh, from some of the papers that I've done with different collaborators, but essentially, you know, especially during the COVID period, we actually spent a lot more time really just, um, you know, networking, uh, collaborating, on possible ideas and, and research papers as well. Uh, I think I've been really fortunate that I've been able to actually secure multiple different small grants to allow me to actually travel around. Uh, I feel that like one reason for doing so is because there's not really very many giant families such as the same. Uh, many of them actually still work mostly on corals uh, or coral reefs. So I basically feel like I have to bring myself over there to introduce what I do 
and get them interested on like why giant plants matter in your country and let's do something about it or let's do something together as well. And I think even though advancing the science of giant plants is important, what I feel that I've really done so through, through, through this period is building the local capacity and local champions, which is even more critical in ensuring the longevity of the science and conservation. So this is my current ambition, which you know, from a I guess like you know, from a girl coming from a little small red dot of Sunny Island, um, when I actually pitched this project to the Pew Fellowship um, back uh, around two years ago, I actually was wondering to myself like, why did I go pitch something so big? Because most of the fellows uh, would actually pitch something within their own country, but I decided that like be ambitious. And I think one of my late professors, uh, Professor Ed Gomez, who is actually a really big champion on this uh, topic and, and animals as well, said that like, you can do it. Just you know, give it a go, dream big, have big dreams, and it's my big dream. And I've been really very excited about it. And earlier this year, we have a regional workshop where we actually brought people come together. So one of the things about workshops is that when you bring people that you never met before, you have this I have this anxiety. I was very worried that why they don't talk to each other? What if like, I don't get along with them? But surprisingly, we just all kind of converge together. Somehow we fit in, somehow we manage to actually have such a fruitful conversation. So this is basically like what happened. Like, no, this is everybody's work. You know, one of the things that we worry is that like, nobody wants to talk about anything. But like, you know, like maybe it was a sad thing, maybe it was how we were so like, you know, uh, passionate about the animal itself, you know, it just kind of brought us together and, and it was really very, very exciting and it was like a very touching moment for myself as well. And like, one of the first things that I did was uh, I just recently published this book uh, and it's really already available online as well. If you're interested, you can actually use this promo code to get this book. Um, I will end if you know, this is a shameless part. If you want, my, if you want me to sign a book, you know where to find me. Come to my very lab. I welcome you guys to come and see my, my humble uh, you know, hatchery. Uh, and with that, I'd like to just really wrap up and say acknowledgements to the different grant, grants and programs who have been supporting my program uh, and the different research work. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your Um, our next speaker, Dr. Nelson Singh, he obtained his PhD in zoology from NUS, but he focused on tadpoles for his dissertation. Um, in addition to amphibians, um, Tsuming has published books on spiders and moths. He has also served um, quite recently as the editor in chief for Nature Watch, which is the official magazine of Nature Society Singapore. Zeming is a key naturalist and he devotes much of his time observing the behavior and ecology of wildlife in Singapore but also around the region. He's also a freelance nature guide, quite a superstar at that. Um, and he enjoys sharing about the wonder and beauty of biodiversity to children of all ages and their parents as well um, and learning abilities with the hope that more eyes will be open to the marvels and the mysteries of the natural world. In one of the chapters in Sensory Odyssey exhibition on the trail of bats, um, it visualizes how seventeen bats see with sound, offering us a glimpse into their unique suite of abilities. And in this talk today, Zeming brings us into the remarkable world of these flying mammals um, to discover their unique adaptations, but also why they are such essential members in our native ecosystem. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the bat section. So, <coughs> very often, uh, one might not use the adjective beautiful for bats, but I personally find them very beautiful. Does anyone out there find the bats beautiful? Wow, okay, very impressive. Well, more than a handful of hands. Fantastic. So, normally the adjective will not be used for bats, uh, but uh, hopefully, I would like to hope more people can find them beautiful because they are, they are very beautiful in many ways. In many cultures, uh, in terms of their design, their flight, they are really quite amazing in mammals. 
Anyone ever wish that you could fly, a dream that you could fly, a really dream that? Yeah. Anyone has ever dreamt that you really flew before? Yeah, that's that's not a very rare one. Toby, you have dreamt that you could fly. Fantastic. So if you have ever had those dreams, then yeah, you probably find out what it's like to be a bat because only bats uh, among all the mammals are capable of true flight. Some of you have heard of, of flying colugo, uh, the flying what do you call it? Um, <coughs> flying lemur, yeah, that's it. Uh, flying lemur, which is also known as a congo, we have them here in our forest. So although they are called flying lemurs, they don't really fly. We also have flying squirrels in Singapore and many other parts of the world, but they don't really fly, just uh, like a bat would do. Yeah. So bats are really amazing creatures, and we do have them in Singapore. Lots of them in the whole region in Malaysia, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. And they are actually very important because they perform quite a number of ecosystem services uh, every evening when they are out. So every time we are as we are sleeping, the bats are really out and about and doing their very very important roles. And we will explore and learn about some of the roles uh, this afternoon. Uh, so as the bats are feasting uh, in the evening. Uh, many many functions are being performed. Let's look at some of them, shall we? See if this works. Okay. <coughs> Who likes durians? Okay, also good show of hands on durians. Yeah. Uh, whether you like them or not, uh, there is a huge following for durians. Yeah, from the Mao San Wang to the Hang He, and so many so many varieties. Durians are a mainstay here. Uh, we are coming to durian season and uh, we are all very familiar with the fruit but many of us may not be aware that before we have the fruit, what do we have? We have the flowers, yeah. So for every fruit, there, there needs to be a flower. Has anyone seen durian flowers before? Not really, yet. we've all seen durians, like them or not, uh, whether we eat them or not. But the flowers are actually quite rarely seen. And this was actually taken by me uh, near Macquarie Reservoir some years ago. And every time I see the durian flowers, I'm very happy because I know in a few months to come, we will be having durian fruit. So what have durians got to do with bats? They are actually pollinated by the nectar feeding bats. Yeah. So this photo was taken uh, in the day, but by night time, uh, uh, fruit bats and nectar eating bats will come and visit them and help to pollinate them. And before we even have the uh, durian flowers, you also have the flower buds. Anyone has seen the flower buds? They look like little green peas, but this is actually what the flower buds of durians are. So you have durian flower trees in the in 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 the, in the park or in the garden near you. If you see this, that's a very, very good sign that the flowers are about to bloom. Okay, so if you don't like durians, you might like this next fruit. Who likes this fruit? Ah, okay, a bit more hands here. This is a uh, wonderful, yummy banana. And have you seen the flowers of banana before? Yeah, this one is probably more common. And did you know that the bats also help to pollinate banana flowers here, yeah, not just in Singapore, not just in Asia, all over the world. Many bats actually will come and drink the nectar of the banana flowers. And that's very, very important. So a lot of banana flowers actually bloom, intentionally bloom at night, and they will attract a wide variety of pollinators, including bats. And sometimes the bat can hover, like in the previous slide, but sometimes they do really hug and stay for many, many minutes and they just stuck their face in the flower, pull up their long tongue and drink as much nectar. If you can see on this slide that the face and the snout of the nectar bat is at least smothered with lots of powder. That powder would be pollen, which is being transferred from one banana flower to another. So, uh, anyone recognize this dish here? Very local dish? Yeah, can you tell me what that dish is? 
Sambal petai, very good. Sometimes you can have it with, uh, this is sambal udang petai. Udang is prawn. You can have it with squid, sambal sotong petai. If you don't like uh, squid or prawn, you can have it with ikan bilis. Very, very yummy, very uh, delicious. Uh, in Chinese, you call it chou dou because the bean is a little bit smelly. So this is quite a celebrity dish in itself yeah, in, in, in the region. So if you look at the green beans, uh, they, they are they are a bit pungent, but that, that adds you know, to the kick. And that gives the, the dish so much flavor. Yeah. Uh, has anyone seen the petai bean before on the on the tree? Yeah. So this is actually what it looks like. I took this photo at the botanic gardens. Yeah. With some it, it doesn't uh, fruit or flower very regularly. But when it does, it is quite a sight. So when it's at this stage, it's the best to harvest it. But they are very uh, high up on the tree. So one needs to harvest it, snip it off, and this is the best stage to, to harvest it and to consume it. If it stays on the tree for any longer, it will start turning brown. And the seeds will be dispersed and grow up as a new tree. But before we get the bean, we also need the flower. Has anyone seen the flower of the Pantai before? So we, if we go back in time, this is actually what the flower of the Pantai looks like. Yeah, very strange, uh, not like a rose or hibiscus. It's dangling like a, a light bulb from a very, very tall tree. This is uh, what it looks like taken in the day, but come night, you get uh, it's like a magnet for nectar beds. Nectar beds will come to it, give it a hug like it's a, a, a bolster, and just lick up whatever nectar is available, and all the pollen will be uh, passed from uh, one flower, one petite flower to another. So, quite an unusual flower with a very important pollinator in place. So, bats all over the world are very important pollinators. Uh, Durian flower, banana flower, some orchids even. So apart from nectar, bats also like feeding on fruits. Anyone can uh, guess what kind of fruit this breed falls are? It's actually found locally. This is a kind of fig. So we have quite a number of fig species in our forests and our parks. So uh, fruit bats love figs, yeah. And as they are feeding on the figs, they will ingest it. The seeds of the figs are very tiny, but when it comes out the other end, they help to disperse the seeds. So uh, bat, fruit bats are very important dispersers of seed, uh, from small ones to little ones. Anyone recognize these uh, egg-shaped fruits? Brown in color, very local. This is the chiku. Has anyone eaten chiku before? Chiku, yeah. Chiku, another very yummy local fruit which the bats also love. So sometimes, uh, nowadays, it's not so easy to see that many chiku trees here. Yeah? But if you do uh, see a chiku tree in fruit in season, and you just hang around there at night, you will see quite a number of fruit bats coming through to feed more than on the ripened ones. So since we're on the topic of fruit bats, did you know that some of the largest bats in the world are actually fruit bats? Can anyone recognize what kind of fruit bat this is? It's also known as the flying fox. And there are many flying foxes from Africa to Asia uh, to Australia even. So uh, they are a very, very large group of uh, bats. And sometimes they are so bold, they will actually fly in the day. They live in flocks of hundreds to thousands, but sometimes uh, they can be hunted. They used to be hunted by some uh, locals in certain Asian countries. But since we are looking at this beautiful flying fox, it's great to look at the anatomy, the skeleton of a typical bat, because they are so large. You can see their wings are basically uh, membranes that are attached to their wrists the shoulder to the wrist, from the wrist to the tip of your very elongated fingers, all across the fingers, and then from that to the ankles. It's a very flexible uh, membrane that will actually capture the air and help them to go from place to place. And if we took an x-ray of the bed, you can see that their anatomy has many similarities to us. They do have a rib cage that protects their lungs as they are breathing. Yeah, some of them may have a long tail, some of them may not have a long tail. 
but all of them have very, very long fingers. The number of digits in your fingers are actually quite the same as ours. So imagine if your fingers were super long and you had a membrane between your fingers, you'd be a perfect bat. You could fly. So apart from nectar eating bats and fruit eating bats, we also have insect eating bats. Very, very important group. And nocturnal insects would include uh, the likes of moths, such as beetles. And as the insects are out about at night, you get the insect eating bats. And many of them uh, have very, very large ears, like rabbits. The better to listen with because they will have to navigate by echolocation. Yeah? So, uh, some of you would have heard of their ultrasound that, you, that they produce which is far beyond our hearing frequency. So this is a sonogram of what a typical uh, uh, bat call is like. If you look at the numbers, it's way above 20 kilohertz. Our human hearing frequency kind of top off, tops off at about 20 or less than 20 kilohertz. But when we, it's higher than 20 kilohertz, it's considered an ultrasound. So a lot of insect eating bats use the use of ultrasound to zoom in on their insect prey in the airspace. Can we uh, hear them with our ears? Uh, usually out in the evenings, very difficult too, but we can use a special device known as a bat detector uh, that can pick up their sound. And uh, very often I will use this, I'll share this bat detector with the children around me in the evenings and they can point the bat detector in the sky and it can capture the sound real time and represent it as clicks. Yeah. So the boy there holding the bed detector is Toby. He's here with me today. And <laughs> his mommy told that oh no, we were at the botanic gardens and looking at the evening sky and watching the beds swirling around. So so we looked at uh, what bats feed on. Let's ask ourselves. And do any creatures feed on bats? Do bats have any predators themselves? Indeed, they do. And this is one uh, extraordinary predator. So uh, specialized is, is it in capturing bats that its name is called the bat hawk. Has anyone heard of the bat hawk? So, so it is called the bat hawk and it, it is a master predator. It's usually not so active in day. I found this in Borneo. It was uh, it was actually building a nest, so it was active in the day. But normally when they are feeding, they will be pouncing on their prey in the evening, just when the bats come out. So that's the very handsome bat hawk for you. Apart from bat hawks, of course, we have nocturnal birds, truly nocturnal birds, that will uh, prey on bats. And these are our friends, yeah? So this is a pair of spotted wood owls and they will include bats in their prey as and when they find them. How do we know that owls feed on bats? Well, actually it's quite simple. Uh, where they perch and we look down on the ground, we often see, see these hair balls uh, down on, on, uh, below their perch. And these are what we call owl pellets because a lot of the fur, the, the feathers, the bones and the skeletons are not uh, digestible. The owls will actually cough it up. And if you take a close look and you dissect through the pellets, you can find parts of the bones. So this is actually the skull of a, a, a house bat, and this is the skull of a food bat. Yeah. So you, you can identify the bat, the, the bat prey by looking at the different skull shape and design. And of course, we have snakes that will feed on bats as well. This was taken by a housewife in a, a local residence some time ago. And she actually found this paradise tree snake trying its best to swallow a bat in a, a residential. So after a, a, a long struggle, you can see that the snake is successful in swallowing the bat. Yeah. So here we are in Singapore. Uh, it is a habitat for bats, but where precisely can we find bats? Where do you stay in Singapore? The green zone, the blue zone, the yellow zone? Yeah. So Singapore is a really small country, but despite our small size, there are many habitats available. 
Uh, of course, the green zones will be the best, the gardens, the parks, the forests, reserves. You can see uh, Pulau Ubi, Pulau Tatong, very nice and green. So these green areas will be probably the top priority for vets that need to live in green spaces. But having said that, uh, vets can also live amongst us in the urban area if there is a nice shelter for them. Any caves in Singapore? Too small, right? We do have some small man-made caves, but not quite. So these beds are actually uh, took while I was in Borneo in a real cave. Uh, and, and they beds, of course, love caves. Anywhere there are caves in the, in the world, usually you have a good chance of finding beds in them. They are very comfortable rules. Uh, she are sheltered from the rain, from the sun. You just have to hang onto the ceiling. So although we don't have any caves in Singapore, uh, we do have expressways, we have concrete all around, and the beds are actually quite adaptable. They can cling to the underside of expressways, highways. Uh, this little cluster was underneath the MRT track. Uh, this family of myotis was inside the culvert that we explored. But apart from the concrete habitats, most of them actually prefer the plant habitats. So uh, there's a cluster of fruit beds hiding in a very uh, shady palm. And some beds will live in the leaf curl of the banana leaf. Uh, one of the more interesting insect eating beds live in bamboo, so they are called bamboo beds. So amongst the bamboo slits, they, they are actually tiny spaces that may seem too tight for us. But all this special group of bats known as bamboo bats they have very very flattened skulls and they can squeeze through these tiny slits and actually make their way home their home there they are so specialized that they can't live anywhere else so they do need bamboos in order to survive so apart from pointing our echolocation device in the sky and measuring their ultrasound we also need to capture them physically. So one of the best ways to capture bats, especially the insect eating bats, is using different kinds of traps. This is known as a harp trap, H-A-R-P, just like the musical instrument. So it's made of a roll of a curtain of string, very fine string, that the bats will run into. The, the uh, flight gets intercepted, they fall into that little basin below, and you can pick them up and handle them with care, measure them, assess their health, and then release them after they are captured. So we do need to capture them. Sometimes when we are examining, examining them and looking through their fur, we can find a certain creature scuttling through their fur. And these are actually very, very unique uh, insects. In fact, these are known as bat flies. They are true actual parasites of many species of bats. And they have actually, many of them have lost their ability to fly, they have practically lost their wings, and their diet basically consists of the blood of the bats. So you can see if this bat fly, its abdomen is full, it's engorged with blood. So often I've been asked if I have any favorite species of bats after having spent some time on bats. And I would say on the top of the list would probably be this very unusual bat. It is known as the naked bulldog bat. Uh, naked because it's, it looks like it doesn't have any fur, but actually it has very, very short fur. And it's actually one of the largest insect eating bats uh, in Singapore, if not around Asia. It has got a lot of very interesting uh, body parts. It has a, a, like a pouch on the side of its arm, which will be used to uh, protect the tips of the wings. It's got a very, very long wing, so it needs to protect the wings in this little pouch on the side. Under its chin, it's got another pouch, which is uh, actually able to secrete a very greasy substance. And it's actually quite smelly, it's quite stinky. If you look at its big toe, it's got very, very unusual bristles uh, growing up from its uh, big toe. Uh, we often wonder what it uses it for, but we, we suspect it's used for grooming itself to remove parasites to clean its body. It's a very, very unusual bat. And if you look at the skull, it's got fantastic uh, teeth. Look at the canines, look at how large it is. 
And if you look at the top of the skull, it's got this kind of like a dorsal fin, like a shark, but it's not a dorsal fin. It's uh, an extension of the skull known as a sagittal crest, which is used for the attachment of muscles. And from that, we can use that the, mark, the, the, the force that it can apply in the bike is uh, very, very powerful. That helps it to crack, crack and crush a beetle as a prey. So in summary, uh, bats are very important because of their pollination uh, ecosystem service. They will help to disperse seeds as they feed on fruits. Uh, they are very good predators of insects, especially the insect eating bats. They can become prey to snakes, owls, uh, and other birds of prey. They are important hosts for very interesting parasites, just like the bat flies. And very often they are very misunderstood and uh, under appreciated amongst all uh, uh, mammals. So really, do we have any reason to be afraid of bats, despite all the bad press that they have received? The actual, actually, the answer is yes, but only if you are a chicken living in South Central America. Because if you're sleeping in the outdoors, uh, you might get bitten by this bat. Anyone can recognize this bat? Uh, this is this is real. This is the real vampire bat, which really feeds on blood. So if you were sleeping outdoors uh, without any protection whatsoever, then you would be sitting duck for the vampire bat. And uh, thanks to bats like this that drink blood, uh, a lot of other bats have uh, received bad press also. But there's really nothing to worry. They very very rarely cause uh, excessive disease, uh, any. Uh, dangerous, fatal diseases. Uh, so, how are bats perceived in other cultures? Uh, just now, Dr. Neil Malin shared about how the bats are perceived by other cultures around the world. So, so, it's always very interesting to see how different animals are portrayed and uh, perceived. Anyone recognize this dinner plate? Any Which country will this plate come from? Yeah, very Chinese, right? very Oriental. So, you can see the beautiful five bad teeth that have been uh, very intricately painted around it. And in Chinese culture, for the longest time, uh, bats have been perceived as being a very prosperous uh, because in Chinese, bats are called bian fu. And when the bat comes to your home, fu dao, so you get uh, prosperity in your home. So they have been very much embraced by Chinese for the longest time. Has anyone seen motifs of bats like this in Singapore before? Is it possible? Uh, if you walk past a certain shop house uh, in Singapore, you might get a chance to see this. So when one day when I was walking past this row of shop houses, I thought I saw a moustache up near the, the, the top. But from closer inspection, you can actually see it was a very uh, Beautifully done bat motif. Yeah, so uh, this is one of the my favorite rooms of shop houses in Singapore. And apart from this, I rarely see them motifs nowadays in other places. Yeah, so uh, hopefully we've learned a little bit more about bats through my brief talk and presentation to you. Thank you for hosting us. I'm still very much on the topic of underappreciated species. We now come to the kingdom of species that are neither plants nor animal. Unsecured is our final speaker for the first track. He's a self taught mycologist and he began his professional foray into the fungi kingdom by being the first to introduce the possibility of growing one's own gourmet and medicinal mushrooms in Singapore. Kat is the founder of Bewilder. It's a microtechnology and microdesign studio that explores the many ways that fungi could help heal our planet and create a sustainable future. His work extends to all aspects of mycological research and development, and he now grows over 40 different medicinal and gourmet mushroom species in the studio. He describes Bewilder as an entity that is very much modeled after the way that mushrooms grow. Predictable yet unpredictable at the same time, largely unseen, suddenly in full glory, radial in growth yet single-minded, exponential and adaptable, 
but most importantly, connecting, interconnecting us all. Please welcome Kiet, who will speak about the science, design, and future of Panjai. Can everyone hear me? Hi. Hi, Mike. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Kiet. I'm the founder of Builder. So, Builder is a micro technological company, and we do all kinds of stuff, basically, with mushrooms. Lah. So, we basically grow garlic mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, micro materials, and micro pesticides, and as well as fungal art. So, Builder has Surprisingly, we found ourselves in the intersection of art, science, and sustainability. And the driving force is actually education. So, be it outdoors, in this case, with Catholic high students, or uh, indoors, in our Fungal Lab in the Cape Mera, where we teach students how to grow mushrooms. So, we believe that education is key in creating the shift from a microphobic population to one that is microphobic. With circularity as, as our core, we biovalorize waste materials such as spent rural springs, um, pokhara, as well as as well as sugarcane baggage that we work closely with from the coffee shop down the road. So we, we change, we convert these materials into gourmet mushrooms such as this. So we have pink oyster mushrooms, kanagis, blue oysters, golden oysters. Takis, lion's wings, and coral mushrooms, which we now sell to a couple of restaurants. At the same time, we also grow medicinal mushrooms, so this is my main area of interest. We grow maybe about 10 different kinds of lingzi, lingzi or reishi mushrooms. So in, in Chinese, uh, lingzi is translated as spiritual herb, the herb of immortality. So. One of the most common questions that people ask me is are we able to grow these mysterious, uh, powerful medicines at home in Singapore? And that got me thinking because growing mushrooms in general is actually not so easy. Um, much more when it comes to growing this kind of uh, medicinal mushrooms. Which got me thinking, right, how, how can I make this more accessible to people? So that kind of began the work in our design. So we came out with this product called the Fungarium, where you can actually grow maybe about five to six different species of reishi mushrooms very easily. So you don't you do not have to mist them or, or give them oxygen. They just kind of, they just kind of grow for themselves in a little container like that. So at the same time, we are able to bring health and wellness agency back to the people. As much as we try to demystify mushrooms, we sometimes get caught up in the mystery as well. So, you know, mushrooms are kind of magical, right? They kind of seemingly appear out of nowhere and then disappear as quickly as they come. But what is more magical than actually mushrooms that grow in a duck? So, there are maybe about 100 different species of bioluminescent mushrooms in, in the world, and we have about maybe I've seen about two or three different species in Singapore. Hi, I just saw you. <laughs> so, this, this particular mushroom is called Phyllobolitus medicularis. It's quite a common mushroom in Singapore, um, but it's nowhere near um, commonly cultivated worldwide. So, of course, I got interested, lah, so I tried to. After about six and a half years, we managed to grow these amazing mushrooms that. Um, Maybe come up for just the four or five days and then they could be able to wait. But the magic is really the impermanence of these amazing organisms. And the beauty of this, this glowing, this, this bioluminescence, is actually a chemical reaction between luciferin, which is a luciferase enzyme, in reaction with oxygen. So the more oxygen you give them, the brighter they glow. And different species glow in different ways. Okay, this is pretty. Um, interesting to me. It's not a big part of things that we do that we will do, but it's, it's very interesting. So this is a handsome fungus beetle that I found on a, on a plant, on a tree. And they, these guys usually hang on the underside of a uh, bracket fungi like uh, Ganoderma, basically leaves. So Ganoderma and Penatum, usually we see a lot of these beetles. 
This particular insect, however, this particular individual was found at eye level, which is very strange, and it wasn't moving. So I, I got intrigued. I went closer and I took it on my hand, and I realized that it was actually covered with mycelium. So mycelium you know, is actually the main body of a fungal organism. Then I brought it back to the lab and we dissected it, and I found out that under the elytra, it's actually covered, completely covered with mycelium. So this insect got completely eaten up by this fungus. It's not cordyceps though. So we, we managed to isolate it down to petri dishes, and then the mycelium started sporulating on the petri dish, which is the image on the right. So the green color stuff, those are the spores. So I managed to, to, to scope it from microscope and managed to identify as a metarhizium species. And metarhizium are known to kill insects as well as being a good plant growth promoter. So, so kind of came the next stage, which is the fun part. I, I, I didn't go out collecting pest insects, they somehow came to me. So we tried, we tried spraying um, insects, pest, pest insects with uh, spores using water as a carrier. So this is a this is a female Javan grasshopper. They are they are very very hardy insects. They last a long time in a container. I know because I used to catch them when I was young. It's not the right thing to say, but sorry. So anyway, we we sprayed cockroaches, we sprayed beetles, we sprayed all kinds of stuff, and they basically die within four days. So this is a good uh, bio pesticide that potentially replace chemical pesticides. So our R&D efforts have also resulted in another pretty interesting product. We managed to develop a strain of fire fungus in our lab that can naturally ferment soya bean. And it looks, optically it looks like tempeh, but what it really does is it actually ferments this soya bean and creates this interesting texture and flavor like liver. So we recently managed to have a tasting session at uh, Open Farm Community where the chef um, I don't know how he got his idea, but, but he made a chocolate mousse out of it and it was well received. So I, I ate it, was pretty good. So, so this, this uh, our idea of is actually kind of uh, it's important because when we can grow foods like this, it actually has a less uh, carbon footprint, it requires a lot less water, and it's a lot more space efficient. So more cost effective to produce in Singapore. Lah. So if we're talking about food security, um, but we found out very quickly that farming mushrooms, um, uh, we can't really feed the nation when, when, we get, when we farm mushrooms because we don't really have the natural resources to do that. But if we can come up with certain novel products like this, maybe we can, we can start talking about 30 by 30. So this is, uh, our, I, guess, I guess this is considered the seminal work that we've done. Um, it's a collaboration with the observatory at the Singapore Art Museum. So we, uh, Chiwai Kaiti gave us the complete creative freedom to, to grow about 14 different instruments and out of, my, out of mushrooms and mycelium. And we allow these organisms to kind of speak for themselves. And by the way, the show is called uh, Refuse or Refuse. And I think in this show, we managed to show that art and science is actually not separate. There is art in science and there is science in art. And this show as well opened our creative and scientific floodgates, resulting in all of this. So from, from earrings to sculptures to lands to fungal um, bouquets, Meishi, Ponza, different expressions of common grey oyster mushroom, one of my favourite mushrooms, very understudied, very underrated. And in our art and design work, we also let the mushrooms speak for themselves. So these are a couple of our lamps. Um, so it's outdoors in a, outside of the shop house in Geelang. And these are, these are our later, later works. And it's interesting. Maybe only to me, I don't know. But we, we know that mycelium acts as a, one of the major properties of mycelium is that it acts as a glue, it binds things together. But in this, in this particular uh, example, we actually allow the mushrooms themselves, the fruit bodies, to connect to one another, resulting in some kind of spot welding. So this, this is pretty exciting to me because it just makes me wonder what else you can create with mushrooms.
So even though we put them in molds to create certain shapes, at the right time, and at the right, um, at the right time, we try to give these organisms a space to kind of be themselves. In this case, sometimes they escape, sometimes they unravel, sometimes they seek, sometimes they even destroy. And by doing so, by giving them the space to do that, we are able to form intimate relationships with these organisms. Most recently, we have also dabbled in um, growing mycelium leather. So, I don't know if people are familiar with microbes in the US, but they are known for their mycelium leather and we are trying to create the same as well. Our early stage processes are really promising, so it's very uh, no, very no waste that we, that we produce from our processes and with, it has minimal carbon footprint. So we also experiment with uh, native species by, by collecting some mushrooms. Since they are food bodies, we are able to just collect and clone the mushrooms very easily. And then we develop strains by breeding them, by breeding the spores, single spore uh, breeding. By working with native species, we are able to grow these things at a much faster rate. Instead of from two to three weeks, we can grow some materials at as fast as five days. Within five days, we can grow a material. So to me, this is super exciting because this sets the tone for the future. What can we actually, what can we actually do with mushrooms? You know, they, the, the, the possibilities are endless. We can mushrooms can heal us, they can feed us, they can clothe us, they can, they can make us warm, they can give us light can as well kill us. So when I used to spend a lot more time in, uh, in outdoors, when I didn't get so caught up in the lab work, I would come across a lot of interesting species, including this one. I'm not sure if, uh, this is the first and only time I've seen this. I'm not sure if anyone has, has seen this mushroom in the wild. But I saw this in uh, East Coast Park on a sea hibiscus tree. So I, was, I went for a swim, uh, very badly I went for a swim one Sunday. Then I was walking along East Coast Park and I, and I thought I saw somebody, I thought I saw a, dip, a paper plate that somebody had littered and put into a hole in the tree. So upon closer inspection, I realized that it was actually an oyster mushroom. It's a local oyster mushroom. So we brought it, I brought it back and I, and I managed to have it under cultivation now, and it's very interesting because this is the I think it's the first time that we discovered that the abalone oyster is from Singapore. That we have a native species here, native strain here. So I think um, to tie this all back into biodiversity, right? I think we just need to study the fungal biodiversity a little bit more because uh, with greater biodiversity. Uh, we can have more uh, security for all life on Earth. So, I think the work has only just begun. As um, mushrooms in general are just highly understudied. I think most people are just afraid of mushroom blood in Singapore. You know, when the rains come, right? After a hot spell, the rains come, mushrooms pop up. I'll be that guy who will be prolling down taking photos of these mushrooms. And someone will just come and tell me to not touch it or not to to smell it, not to pick it. <laughs> but the reality is we need to study these organisms a little bit more. It's, a, it's kind of a new frontier. Out of maybe about five to six million species of mushrooms worldwide, I think scientists have only discovered, uh, identified about 120 to 150,000 different species. So the more we discover, the more we can think of what kind of applications, what kind of potential and real world applications that we can have here on Earth instead of going to Mars, right? But that's the other exciting part about, about mushrooms because um, mushrooms actually do get melanized and right? they get in contact with uh, radiation. So I think they have even sent mushrooms to space and back safely. So it's possible to actually grow mushrooms in space and to grow materials in space, growing structures in space for astronauts, for future generations of human beings. Um, but back on Earth, we should try to solve the problems here first before we think of going to Mars. <laughs> so I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. So it's very short.
I'm going to bring the rest of the speakers for the first track back up on stage. So, uh, maybe I'll just love to start with the question for now first. Um, we were talking a little bit about your long trajectory in creative entrepreneurship. Um, and I'd love to get you to share a little bit more about the genesis of Sensory Odyssey um, in the context of maybe your long um, career in the creative industry. Um, this exhibition is a very elemental journey with the natural world at, at its core of the storytelling. Um, what was the impetus for this project for you and the team? Hello. Um, well, simply put, I've been producing shows for the last 30 years. And shows that had uh, a lot of international appeal because they were worth this experience and spectacles. And so I had developed an understanding of what shows would work from China, from Brazil, from New York, to Russia. Uh, and that was something that was quite unique. Not very many people are merchants of international spectacles like that. And uh, I knew very little about nature and science. But I understood uh, in the last decade that uh, the world was changing very, very rapidly. And uh, I always had a passion for this philosophy of science and, and natural sciences and from a very amateur standpoint. And I was thinking, what can I do? How can I contribute to a world of changing and help to maybe you know, bring new generations to be more conscious and to do something? And so I just went on this adventure thinking to myself, we have technologies today that allow us to um, capture and stage all of these contents. We have sciences, new sciences that help us understand how we can change, uh, how we can touch people uh, inside. Um, and I ventured on the adventure down this road, thinking to myself, well, if I can do something for the next 30 years of my life, I'd like to do it around natural sciences. I'd like to bring natural sciences uh, accessible to larger audiences, use whatever creative tool, mind there is to tell all these stories in different ways, be close to the scientists that are doing this field work, and be just the voice, you know, help transmit that voice, make it larger, uh, and and spend um, really a long, you know, most of my life, I guess, by the books, my travels, my encounters, and my work, try to have everything channeled in this infinite uh, world of discovery and sharing those discoveries. Speaking about um, discoveries and intersections, Kia, I'm going to come to you next. Um, your work as a mythological artist, a researcher, cultivator, it operates on so many different levels. Um, and and we were when we were talking to you in, in Buolda, you were growing mushrooms, you were doing research, you were developing prototypes, making art at the same time. Um, and we heard from you just now that you were also involved as a key collaborator of the Observatory on Refuse Refuse Exhibition. Um, can we get you to share a little bit about at what point did you have the impulse to start working with mushrooms as sculptural objects? Uh, can you hear? Sorry. <coughs> uh, to be honest, I think I'm just having fun. So I think having fun is pretty important in the lab, otherwise it just gets boring. So I like, I like to play around uh, just to see what these organisms can do, you know, and like, purposely contact different cultures and things like that. So, so making sculptures, I guess, it's, uh, came quite naturally. Uh, growing, so I work mostly with uh, reishi mushrooms. Um, just watching them grow is, is kind of alienating actually because they look like aliens, alien life forms. But they actually got me thinking, right? Actually I am the one who's in the nature. And, and after working with these mushrooms uh, for much longer time, I realized that they actually could grow some of some of the trees can actually grow in very high CO2 environments. So that's how they get a lot of us actually stretching to look for oxygen and, and light. Then we, then I managed to just kind of let, let it let this thing like in the box. <laughs> so, so then I also realized that they are actually phototropic 
so they grow to a slide. You know, from the synthesized, they kind of power fuel, but they grow to a slide. So by changing the, the light the direction of the light, they actually allow the mushrooms to kind of form sculptures in their, by themselves. Right? So, so then, then I challenge myself, how, how big of a, of a, of a reishi uh, bonsai can I grow? And so I just, just went on from there. Bigger and bigger and crazier and crazier. And then now later it was a bit interesting because we managed to grow different uh, lots of mushrooms and letting them become one. So that works with some, some species, not all. So it's actually trying to figure out what, what works and what doesn't. Um, well, before I get the question to Zeping next, I know that Toby is somewhere in the audience and it's nice to see such a young audience come to our symposium. Um, so question for Zeming. Uh, Zeming, you're very much an educator and in the nature works that we have had the privilege of being with you on, um, it's very apparent that environmental education, um, but also emotional learning, uh, domains that quite naturally overlap. And we see that in your, in your walks. Um, would you speak to this and why you feel very strongly about encouraging children to connect with nature, um, but to explore and understand our natural environments to more play-based kind of learning? Um, I think we all are fully aware that the, the younger generation is going to and is spend a lot of screen time. So by just putting the screen aside and going into the forest, the gardens, and smelling the fresh air in the forest, and just putting their fingers on the flowers and the fruits and the branches, that, that uh, gives them as much of a sensory appeal as nature can give. It's different all the time. When the rain is coming, they can smell the oncoming rain, they can see the light changing, they can see the clocks rolling in. When it's sunny, they can feel the heat in the skin. Uh, but as soon as we go back into the forest under the shade of the trees, they feel how cool it is and they, they, they really appreciate how important a uh, good forest is. Uh, I remember very fondly where I started a nature walk and uh, we were supposed to meet at the car park. And uh, it was a typical sunny day in Singapore, and uh, the kids were starting to whine already. But uh, as soon as we went into the forest, the people we went, I just paused for a moment and showed them the trees above us, and just made them realize how important these trees are. And we, almost before I could finish my sentence, uh, the, the girl just sprinted out, I love you trees. And yeah, that, that just yeah, made my Part down there and then and they, they just they just get it, you know, how important trees are how they can really control the climate as a buffer and you know. So it's really many, many multiple moments like this when I see and that the kids realize that they, they, they how important nature is to, to them and to, to the whole ecosystem that I find it so uh, satisfying. Um, I didn't add this when I was introducing Zeming, but um, he is a really important figure in the homeschooling community here in Singapore. He has a lot of outdoor-based kind of learning with children, but the parents as well. Um, I'm going to move on to Mei Lin. Um, Mei Lin, one of the other dimensions of your research, which I think we didn't have the time to cover, um, it, it focuses on learning the term. And um, you recently worked on the Singapore's um, National Action Strategy on marine litter, and you've also been asked to review the status of marine plastic research and policy in the Asian region as well. Um, what do you consider to be some of the more urgent challenges that we're facing with marine plastics pollution, um, and perhaps some of the issues that you'd like to see prioritized? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree with that topic and um, you know how one aspect of the exhibition as um Kunel was sharing is you know, how leaving that particular scene where the scope will have you know that plastic bag trapped there. Um I mean like we have a lot of information and good evidence that marine litter does have a negative impact, uh, not just on the environment itself but um, of the many different organisms that live uh, in the oceans um, and myself like focusing more on 
the research side, like we're more interested in how we can actually harmonize the methodologies for actually monitoring uh, marine litter uh, that's like sort of like around the uh, around the world or around the region as well. And we find it critical because everyone is very invested. I think it's a topic that even from many of the ground up groups, um, NGOs uh, and research groups, they're all very interested in the topic itself and trying to use it to engage with public in sharing stories about the pollution happening in the oceans. But I think one of the issues is that so much of this effort um, is not really very properly captured. Like we don't, there's no avenues for either putting the information to a, a general database or if the information that's collected is not very consistent so that it makes it very difficult to actually really truly compare like you know region A and region B what's what's going on so maybe you know from a not non-scientist perspective from an, uh, you know the, you might you might ask me like why is it so important to make sure that the methods and approaches are similar or the same uh, it's it's this is comes down to the rigor of the science and rigor of how we can actually better talk to policy makers. Like sometimes these information do matter to the people that we talk to. Um, so this area of work I, I don't specifically look at, but I have a team of colleagues who looks after the policy side of things and these are exactly what policy makers are looking for. They will always be asking for the data, is it comparable, is it consistent? Um, and you know, at the end of the day, they look back to the scientists, and you know, we just sometimes don't have that kind of information. And if you are, and you know, going back to one of the last part, which is like, what would I think would be a prioritization? Is that, uh, to be honest, I don't have an answer for what I'm going to share. Is that how can we actually better um, share and not just raise awareness, but how can we better share the actual impacts of? Of, you know, marine litter in the ocean environment. We know that it's there, we know that it impacts the marine life. To some extent, there are some research up and coming really showing the, the, the food chain. You know, microplastics going through the different animals and reaching to our food plates. But I don't see an urgency in people. That's really, that, that's really what struck me with the entire conversation about marine plastic pollution. That, that has been ongoing for a couple of years now is the very fact that there's so much information, so much visual, so much image but people are not acting on, on it and to be honest, I don't have an answer because like, if the science is there already if the information that is already been distilled and yet we are not able to actually translate it into an action then there, there has to be something that's not working in this mechanism or in this process and we're still, I'm at least trying to figure out, and I think many of us are trying to figure out as well. Actually, one of the things that Dr. Hari Vishnu, who um, is one of the other collaborators in the Discovery Gallery, um, he mentioned that we know less about our oceans than we do about space, and it's such a stark statement to, to hear from an ocean scientist. Um, and I think just, just resonating with what you said earlier about how we probably need to be a lot more strategic in our efforts and understanding and protecting and conserving our nation, our, our oceans. Um, I'm going to come to the floor and have a question from Mr. Go so we can hand the mic to him. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, a couple of questions you can think of you that you'd like to answer. For the sensory policy exhibition, um, you talk about engaging the senses, uh, so I believe we engage in your side um, you know, sound, uh, smell as well. So how about like touch and taste? And also like, um, have you talked about incorporating like VR or AR elements into the exhibition? And like, do you have a favorite, you know, uh, section in the exhibition uh, that uh, you have really keen? And maybe for the rest of the other speakers, just very good one. Um, like, um, have you tried, you know, like, uh, giant cultured plants and how does it taste like? Is your um, previous superhero Batman? And you know, how about mushroom? Like you've tried, you know, growing so many of them, like what is your favorite or which tastes best? Thanks. You've, you've got it covered. So we will go slowly. Yeah, we'll start with Cornell first. 
about the other sort of sensorial elements? Yes, of course. Um, touch, touch doesn't mean uh, just touching with our fingers. We touch through our bodies. We touch through movement. The fact the fact that we're walking from room to room, and there are different things, ventilation, etc. There's the things we do touch with our fingers. We can shift, We can certainly explore that much further. Uh, we're still in the, in the building grounds of this project, uh, and we do have the intention of adding a lot of theatrical props and things you can touch and climb on and sit on that, you know, like a giant worm that you can sit on, that can make you know, all of these things are part of the project, but we have to go in steps. Uh, in terms of AR and VR, um, we, we, I kind of saw this project as being a theatrical, uh, a theatrical version of a VR experience, but with no devices and being, making it collective. We like the idea of of gender creating a space that would be something like a VR, but have the definition of an image and such that the VR would not have, and be able to share it directly with other people around you. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we could not de develop also VR or AR applications uh, as a complement to the experience to kind of go deeper in either the educational or, or deeper into like zooming in to, to, to things that we could not do if it, if within a physical space. Uh, and the third question was about um, oh no, the favorite section for me is uh, is impossible because uh, essentially, obviously, there are many things that we can do a lot better, but it is a journey in many steps, and then each session has its moment, its importance. Uh, everything cannot just be spectacular. Uh, they have to have moments of doubt, moments that are. So the slower moments that are bigger, and it's a combination of everything, like in a theater, like in a, in a, in a theater piece or a piece of music. Uh, every moment has its uh, part. We'll be very excited to see how the next iteration of the exhibition evolves. Then, um, the question from me, Liz, would you like to ask it again? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. I think like he asked if like we have tried eating. <laughs> I suppose like that could be part of the sensory next time, like replicating the taste of certain marine animals. Uh, I personally um, very recently only tried it when I was in Palau you know, as an experiential part of my research trip. Uh, and I, I, I had to say it was my first and very last one because I just couldn't accept the taste and you know having worked with the animals for so long. But I guess like more broadly, there are people who eat them very often and they do have preferences. And so they say that some species are sweeter, some species are more like there's more texture in the meat. Um, and, and also like culturally there are many ways of preparing it as well. So locally there, I think mixing it with coconut milk is something like nice or it sounded nice, but I would not probably go and try it ever. So, the next question for is about Batman. Yeah. Isn't that your favorite superhero? <laughs> I wonder if that's the right thing to say. Okay, we'll move on to the question for Okay. Uh, the question was, which is my favorite mushroom for eating, right? Uh, contrary to popular belief, I don't actually eat that many mushrooms. I love the real mushrooms, but I think my favorite one to eat would probably be the lion's meat. Yeah, because when you grow it, it gets, it's kind of like a meat texture to it, so it's pretty interesting. Um, any more questions from the floor? Okay, maybe I'll just... I, I would love to, for example, just I would love to have a mushroom wall in the exhibition where we're under the soil and, and so something that's evolving or even a blob. Or, those are the kind of things we would love to also integrate, not only touching, but living organisms. We do we love organisms. Um, well, I do have a last question before we close the Q&A. We have massively overrun. Um, but if you have questions for some of the well-known speakers that we have here, please feel free to come up to them later. Um, the final question that I have with all of you um, actually is something that um, that came up in the conversation with me about um, the different ways that we can think about and talk about nature. And I'd like to make this a very personal question. Is there a particular piece of nature that is very close to your heart or holds a particular belief for you? 
Um, I think growing up, uh, nature has always been something about curiosity. Like that's how I connect nature. Like everything that when I, when, when I was young and my parents brought me around, and it was just fascinating to just be in a space that is not my house. And it's, it could just be just a, a short walk around or even just um, yeah, looking around at different things and that's my my short take on my yeah, my connection with nature. Uh, well, I like I love water and air and fire and wood and the earth and yeah, I love it all. I think for, <coughs> for me, I, my, I, I do have a particularly strong sense of smell. So I think it's the smell of nature that really uh, inspires me. When I walk into a botanic garden, so I pick up some a flower in bloom, or I, I just go to the seaside and I can just get the salt in, in the air. That really uh, fires up my, my inspiration. Mm, I actually. Well, all of this is kind of natural in a way as well, right? I like, I like, I like spending time in the forest a lot. I like going out for walks if I can. Um, and just having a bit of a quietude by myself and spending time. I think, I think a lot of the time we kind of, we ourselves get in the way of, of, of experiencing life. For me, the forest has always been a very special place. I grew up in the west of Singapore, so we did Timah Nature Reserve, Rifle Ridge Road. Spend a lot of time there. Um, yeah, yeah, sometimes it's not just going for a walk. Sometimes it's just staying put in a place and just observing because through observation, right? Just giving time, spending time. Mm. That's why I realized everything is it's always been there. It's all, it's all been there. You don't have to actually go out and look for something. And it's so amazing that the you know, proverbial mushroom, for example, right? Is, it's host so many other stuff that's going on, from, from flies to, to beetles, things like that. It's this whole ecosystem becoming, becoming a whole. And, and one cannot be without, cannot exist without the other. So everything is interconnected. Whether it's mushrooms or ants or whatever you study, I think it's, I think that's one of the bigger messages of, of uh, what nature has to offer. Like, it's like everything is interconnected, so we, we ought to Start paying attention, start paying attention because it's so hot, man. Like, it's so cold in here, but it's like so hot. Well, um, Gwenelle, something Nathan and Kit, thank you so much for making space today to um, consider the relationship that we have with the extraordinarily complex um, nature systems around us. We also think about ways that maybe we can help ensure that our future generation um, can enjoy our natural world as well um, and the incredible species that call this place home. Um, we hope you get a chance to visit Sensory Odyssey exhibition and also join in the slate of programs that Adrian was speaking about in his opening remarks um, from a screening program with films that traverse diverse natural environments to guided tours of the exhibition and jumping activities um, that look into the super senses for animals and more. We are always grateful for the incredible network of collaborators that we pull into an exhibition like this and its programs, um, and all of you in the audience who continue to be a part of the Arts Nights Museum story. Um, we'll be starting the 10 for 0 awards and roundtables um, very soon, so for those of you who have registered for the second track of the program, please hold on to your registration stickers so that our front of house colleagues can enter, um, can, can admit you into the space when the time is right. Um, there are refreshments and coffee and tea right outside the gallery as well. Please enjoy the break and thank you for joining us at this first part of Sensory Odyssey Open Symposium's um, program. In conjunction with the launch of Sensory Odyssey of Exhibition and articulating our shared commitment to the health of Earth's climate, ecosystems, and biodiversity, it's a privilege to be presenting Conservation International's 
inaugural 10.0 awards that recognize the next generation of environmental leaders. I'm delighted to welcome Danushri Kumasingha, Senior Project Coordinator at Conservation International Singapore, who will be hosting the second part of today's program. Uh, a very good afternoon to Dr. Jin Jio, uh, Senior Vice President of Conservation International Asia Pacific in Division, distinguished judges, partners of Conservation International, award winners of uh, the 10 for 0 awards, CI staff, and members of public. Welcome to the inaugural 10 for 0 award ceremony. So I'm Danu, uh, I will be your MC for today. Okay, so firstly, I would like to thank our partners, uh, Las Vegas Sands, Clean the World Foundation, and the Art Science Museum for hosting this event. We are honored to be a part of Sensory Odyssey into the heart of our living world. Sensory Odyssey is a multi-sensory and immersive exhibition that brings visitors on a journey from the salt lakes of the savannah to the Arctic Circle, from the rainforest canopy to the depths of the earth and the oceans. Conservation International Singapore is proud to present the 10 to 0 Awards, a celebration of Singapore's environmental youth leaders. This award recognizes the efforts of 10 capable and creative young individuals aged 18 to 35, advocating for a future of zero waste, net zero carbon emissions, and a healthy natural world. Over a nomination period of six weeks, we received uh, almost 50 applications and the finalists underwent a tough interview process with several rounds of interviews and a final selection by a panel of esteemed judges uh, representing the diverse backgrounds. The 10 award winners will join an exclusive youth network that provides mentorship from global conservation experts, participation in climate summits and research projects, and, the, and project development support from Conservation International. To kickstart the inaugural 10 for 0 award ceremony, we are honored to have Dr. Richard Jio uh, from CI. So, Richard uh, directs Conservation International's work in the Asia Pacific region, overseeing strategies and outcomes in 13 countries. He guides the organization's role in international and regional networks, as well as partnerships with both the private and the public sector. Prior to joining CI, he served as the Montana State Director for the Nature Conservancy, where he led programs that permanently protected more than 250,000 acres of critically important private land and played a leadership role in some of the largest successful conservation deals ever completed. It is our honor to have him here today, Richard Keyes. Yeah, thanks, thanks to everyone for being here, and you know, I'm not sure about this whole guest of honor thing, but uh, I'm happy to be kicking off. And the first, the first thing that had occurred to me is, uh, you know, we often think of work in conservation and sustainability as like this, this work of loss, like you should have been there yesterday, you should have been there a decade ago. But I was just in Raja Ampat, you know, the province of West Papua and uh, with some folks from Temasek, Geraldine, our Singapore country director. Um, and, you know, we got to snorkel a little bit, meet with communities. And every time I'm there, I'm just amazed because it really is the best place in the world for coral reefs, for marine diversity. And it's better now than it ever has been, you know, from a nature point of view and from a community point of view in the modern era. You know, uh, 20 years ago, it was a place where bomb fishing uh, was happening all over these reefs, and the communities really had very little access to livelihoods. And today, it's a vibrant, tourist-driven economy. Uh, we help create million, you know, literally millions of protected areas, millions of hectares of protection. You know, that's led by communities, and that that protection drives your livelihood. So things really can get better. 
you know, and I came up away from that trip reminded that, you know, it's just hopefully everyone in this room can see places and these, these special places that have gone better from your efforts. So this idea of optimistic action is what we're all about here today. So it's, it's, it's very inspiring for me to be here with uh, these, these leaders today that are taking action because, you know, you know, when the world often looks bad. It's like, you know, there's bad news, climate change, wars, you know, inflation, economic problems. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't take action. Like, you know, 55 years ago, 1968, you know, the year that I was born, uh, Paul Ehrlich wrote this book called The Population Bomb, where he said, look, there's going to be so many people in the world we will not be able to feed them. That, that didn't happen because, you know, humans are very resourceful. The Conservation International really does take this kind of optimistic, action-oriented view. You know, we're global, our regional hub is in Singapore, you know, as Danny mentioned, you know, we're working in 14 countries around the region, um, we have 1,500 staff around the world that really do work on the ground on these solutions. Uh, we work on three big themes, uh, nature-based solutions for climate, protecting these critically important ecosystems, carbon-rich ecosystems that are important to keep the world cool. We also protect oceans. We want to double marine protected areas over the next 10 years. And we work to build nature positive economies. You know, we have scientists and bankers and economists and policy experts that work directly with people on the ground and with governments. Governments are our key partners in all these places. You know, so we basically raise money you know, from various donors um, and deploy it on the ground. Uh, but working with governments is not enough. You know, even, even if government decides to uh, you know, implement marine protection or protect the forest or do an economic development initiative, it still has to work on the ground. Uh, and one lesson that we've learned is that even when governments and private sector have recognized this idea that protecting nature and building climate resilience it's not a nice to have, it's really essential, it's an existential problem that we all have to solve. You know, just that top-down action is not enough. It's especially true in a place like Singapore. We know government alone won't save us. The best solutions come from the ground up, from the people. At CI, we learn working directly with communities and amplifying those solutions that really do work, learning from the people on the ground that are working every day to figure out these problems is the best way ahead. That building civil societies that are educated and engaged in these issues like climate and waste management and oceans and nature is critical to, challenge, to tackle these challenges we all face. And youth, young people, that's the key demographic, demographic for building civil society solutions that work. And that's why one of our focuses at CI, especially CI Singapore, is on youth. Uh, we lead school programs, you know, we work with interns and scholars at these great Singaporean institutes of higher learning. We work to empower and inspire the country's youth to participate in solutions needed for Singapore and the world. And we think Singapore in its position here can be influential to lead this movement for the region and the world. And that's the, you know, the big reason why we are here today. Um, so I'm very excited to be a part of this inaugural 10 for Zero Awards. You know, and I apologize in advance to our awardees, you know, our winners. You know, you're the first ones, which means you're the guinea pigs. Um, you know, we want to really uh, work with you as partners and amplify the learnings and your networks and your energy and your passion for nature. Uh, 10 for Zero Awards today is supported by Drop by Drop Grant from Las Vegas Sands and Clean World Foundation. The Drop by Drop reinvests capital from Sands water stewardship efforts into innovative projects that increase local water resiliency and reinvigorate ecosystems and incubate new solutions that engage communities. Great programs, great partners. Uh, I'd also want to thank our judges for their expert opinion and valuable time. It's really fun to be, you know, in the room with the judges, you know, and really hard. You know, we had some, we had over like 50 plus applicants that we narrowed down to finals. 
And it was very difficult and very competitive to come up with this first, you know, class of 10 winners. Uh, so thank the judges, Kathleen Tan of the Lumen Foundation, who's also on the CI Singapore board as a trustee. Uh, Dr. Karen Toon, who's on the National Parks Board. Uh, Professor Roman Carusco at NUS. Uh, Dr. Sandia Sriram from Shiok Meats. Uh, Meredith Bojan from Red Bay Sands. Uh, Dan Anderson from EB Impact. And Wu Chi, Wu Chi Yun, who's a youth sustainable, sustainability advocate. So again, as I was saying, our ambition is the 10 for zero class this year is just the start. You know, and even just to start for this group, we want to continue to engage you as leaders. You know, take your advocacy, whether it's taking your advocacy work to help you take it to a more global stage, or as you work to execute and scale up locally, um, we want to learn from and amplify these innovative solutions. So, you know, we hope the winners will receive uh, will continue to work with us as partners. They'll receive coaching and mentorship from our network of global conservation experts. They'll have opportunities to participate in both local, regional, international conservation efforts, whether they be in the field research or at these international summits. And we want the 10 for Zero program to be a platform for leaders to form meaningful connections and work together for greater impact. You know, each, your work individually is just amazing, but we hope that as a collective, as a collective, your impact can really be much greater than the sum of parts. You know, one example, uh, it was recently announced that, that the Earthshot Prize is coming to Singapore, you know, Prince William's Earthshot Prize um, in November. And this will be a very cool thing where uh, uh, the Earthshot Prize will announce uh, five global winners in categories, um, you know, like waste management, climate change and oceans. And they did this cool green carpet thing where they have A-list celebrities give out these awards. So it really does, the idea is to bring focus to conservation and sustainability you know, in places like, you know, like the Asian Pacific region where it really matters and use Prince William's platform to, to, to bring focus. You know, and we hope that the 10 for Zero uh, winners will help us really you know, amplify some of the great work in the region, you know, at that Earthshot platform. So that's just one example of how we hope to engage you all. Um, and just back to this idea of doomsday, doomsday prophecy versus like versus uh, optimistic, hopeful action. The world needs the latter. We need action. You know, when Paul Ehrlich wrote that book, The Population Bomb, he said, "Quote: The battle to feed the world is lost." You know, he said, India can't possibly, in 1968, he said, India can't possibly in the next decade feed, you know, another 200 million. There'll be just human suffering and starvation. We have to prepare for that. You know, much like some of the rhetoric we hear in Duke's day around climate change. And the data is not wrong, right? These, these challenges are ahead of us. But taking that doomsday approach doesn't really help us. You know, at the same time, you know, one of my heroes, uh, Norma Borlai, who's a, you, many of you may not have heard of him. He's the father, known as the father of the Green Revolution. He's sort of the opposite of Paul Ehrlich. Ehrlich was like a Stanford big head elite scientist. Um, Norman was like the DuPont, like food scientist. Uh, and he's, instead of just saying, you know, people are going to starve, we got to like, you know, have forced birth control. He said, let's figure out how to feed all these people. And he did literally hundreds and thousands of iterations of, and figured out how to make wheat and cereal grain crops yield more, and then how to export those seeds to places like Pakistan and India. Very, very practical, on-the-ground action that resulted in you know, just a tremendous uh, system that was able to feed the world you know, and continues today. Uh, that's the kind of optimistic action that this group leaders and bodies, and that's what the world wants. And we're just delighted to be here as part of it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Richard, for the speech. And now we would like to invite Richard to uh, just remain on stage uh, to present the trophies for the 10 Zero award winners. So we will be announcing the names in alphabetical order.
and uh, maybe invite the winners to please remain on stage after you collect your prize. All right, first up is uh, Heng Li Seng. Leasing promotes sustainability and driving positive environmental impact. Green Nudge builds thriving green communities through various initiatives and has engaged over 200 organizations to collect marine debris and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So next we have uh, Kong Man Jin. She's unable to attend today. Uh, Man Jin, also affectionately known as MJ, is the co-founder of Just Keep Thinking a science and nature channel with over 450 followers across all platforms. As a former science teacher, she believes in the power of education and now uses her social media as a tool for environmental and science education to reach global audiences. Next, we have Muhammad Nasri. Executive Director of the Singapore Youth Voices for Biodiversity. Nasri works closely with different stakeholder groups in Singapore on a multitude of issues ranging from managing human-wildlife interactions to land use development plans. He believes strongly in the potential for youths to push for large-scale systematic changes and hopes to create more spaces for them to try. Next we have Anthony Kian. Over a decade of experience, Lee Kian promotes environmental education and conservation through Young Nautilus, an environmental education organization she co-founded. Young Nautilus reaches over 10,000 audiences annually through nature team programs such as biodiversity walks, conservation talks, and values in action workshops. Next, we have Ho Chu Sian. founded Margoria, a business that chemically reforms contaminated and unsorted plastic waste into a novel material used to build roads. Supported by the National Youth Council and the Ministry of Environment and Sustainability, she also founded M Impact, which focuses on youth environmental literacy programs to help younger generations engage with sustainability issues more holistically. Next, we'd like to invite Pamela Lowe. Businesses can be a force for good and uses innovative business solutions for climate change and addressing inequality. She has worked and contributed to multiple environmental organizations and founded Tinkat Heroes. In her journey, she focuses on creating economically viable solutions and incentivizing private stakeholders to take action. Next, we have Sam Chin. is a marine biologist who conducts research, publishes articles and influences policy making process, processes on environmental and wildlife management. She co-founded Our Singapore Reefs, a community group that organizes cleanup activities involving over 1,200 volunteers and raises awareness for coral reef ecosystem protection and conservation. Next up, we have Samantha Tian. <laughs> Samantha founded Sea Stable, a business that supports marine conservation and expanded its reach to several ASEAN countries. It has supported over 33 global projects and has committed over 50,000 Singapore dollars to marine conservation. She is also actively involved in sustainability and youth leadership initiatives where she serves in multiple leadership positions. Next, we have Therese Tio. She is also unable to attend today. As an intersectional environmentalist and aspiring environmental lawyer, Therese has a keen interest in environmental justice and community empowerment. She presently serves as president of Singapore Youth for Climate Action and organizes various outreach activities such as policy workshops and panel discussions. 
I would like to uh, invite Yasser Ramil. <laughs> Organizing regular beach cleanups to developing the Stridey app for impact tracking and going beyond to nurture a spirit of civic engagement, Yasser serves as an environmental advocate from his position as the Chief Stridey Officer at Stridey. He works to build communities that work together for sustainability and conservation and has a keen interest in addressing urban waste management issues. All right, maybe invite everyone that's on stage uh, for a group photo, please. And also very good if we can invite you up on stage. Thank you. My name is MJ and I'm the co-founder of a science and nature channel called Just Keep Thinking. My love and passion for all things wildlife and nature related really sparked off from this three days, two nights camp that I had in my JC days. We were on St. John Island and we experienced the forest, the mangroves, the marine intertidal zone and it has led me on this journey to learn more about our environment and how we can protect them and I've never looked back since. Now, as a content creator, I create videos for the channel and use social media as an effective tool for outreach and advocacy work. I too was someone who thought that, you know, social media is just a place for mindless entertainment and there's nothing educational about it, but I never knew the amount of impact it could have. I do believe that we are the first educational channel in Singapore with a significant following that extends beyond Singapore and I'm really grateful to take on this challenge to use a tool that has been viewed so negatively and create something positive out of it. On top of being in the digital sphere, I've been conducting physical outreach as well through our nature-guided walks, learning journeys for both schools and corporates, discussion panels, sharing sessions, assembly talks, and even though it has been really tiring, it has been really fulfilling as well, and all of these programs are worth it, and I never once regretted it. I've always been doubting myself a little bit, not knowing the kind of impact that my work has, but every single message and comments that I receive cheering me on and encouraging me on are like, small little reminders for me to see value in the work that I do and there are also small motivational pushes for me to continue on and never give up which I'm glad I didn't. To be someone that people actually look up to is a really big responsibility that I do not take lightly at all and it actually motivates me to become a better person so that I can become a better role model for everyone especially the younger generation. And I hope when they look back and people think of MJ, they will remember me as someone who is funny, who is passionate, positive, but most importantly, someone who inspired them in one way or another. I hope you guys have enjoyed this small introductory video of myself and thank you to Conservation International for giving us this amazing opportunity to present ourselves. That's all from me. Bye-bye. Hello, I am Sam. I'm a marine biologist, diver, and an educator. So at the Tropical Marine Science Institute, my research largely focuses on coral restoration in the region, especially in Singapore. And because I spend a lot of time underwater, it gives me the first-hand experience of the impacts of human activities on our coral reef. That includes marine debris. So with the intention to raise awareness about these marine conservation issues, I co-founded our Singapore Reef in 2017. So our Singapore Reef is a community initiative where we aim to bring together like-minded people through dive cleanup and educational activities. I am also very big and passionate about capacity building and knowledge sharing, especially from my experience in coral conservation, marine science, and marine conservation. So through my role as a volunteer scientist in various organizations, I develop and execute educational programs to the public in the region. 
right? So through this 10 to 0 awards, I hope to reach out to the wider audience, collaborate with other young leaders in this field and also with CI to hope to inspire the next generation to find a career in marine science and also you know, do their part for the environment. Hi everyone, my name is Sam from Singapore and I'm the founder of Seasonable. I started Seasonable in 2017, seven years ago, to tackle marine conservation in Asia. Since then, we've gone over to support over 50 micro projects, contributing over 50,000 Singapore dollars to over six different ASEAN countries. Our projects ranged across capability building with the coastal community in Malaysia. Uh, we have created waste banks in Southwest Sulawesi. Uh, we've also partnered with Carbon Ethics in Indonesia to look at mangrove planting as well as supporting many other projects in Philippines, Vietnam and Malaysia. Through this whole process, it's been really wonderful as I've seen how Sustainable has grown um, from one person, although it's just me now, um, through impacting the lives of many others. So I'm applying because I'm looking to see what is the next step for Sustainable um, and looking to see how much more we can grow, how we can develop potentially into a foundation and look to continue protecting, collaborating with youth in ASEAN countries, supporting the cause of marine conservation. So thank you very much and wishing all a great day ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Therese and I go by Shia Pronounce. I'm an intersectional environmentalist and an aspiring environmental lawyer. Currently, I'm also 22 years old and an undergraduate student majoring in environmental and political science at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. I am also president of the local climate group Singapore Youth for Climate Action or SYCA and co-mobilizing team member of Youth for Ecocide Law, a subgroup under Stop Ecocide International. I think I'll share sharing a bit about why I started my environmental journey. Whenever I saw pictures of mass environmental damage, something inside me will break. And it's been this way since I was a child and still is the same today. Like, for example, a picture of plastic pollution will hit me the same wave of sadness and regret the first or the tenth time that I see it. For all the blessings that she has given us and endowed upon us, I find that unnecessary pollution and environmental degradation is an act of injustice against Mother Nature, an act of injustice to the people and animals who must live in degraded environments daily. Polluted activities have become a norm in our society today, but they should not be. Many say that it's a cost of doing business and point to the need to grow the economy. But I find, how long can we keep growing this economy while uh, and turn a blind eye to these acts of harm that are damaging the lives of the very people that we claim to protect? For how long can we let these billionaires get richer and richer while the less of the people and the animals lie in peril? This is just a few things that I've learned from the climate movement over the years, having been involved in climate activism for the last three years. I realised that climate justice is a concept that lies at the heart of the movement and it connects us to other social movements and should function as the foundational principle to our national climate strategy such as defining a just transition. I find that Singapore has a long way to go towards even defining climate justice, much less putting it into practice on the national agenda. And I hope that thus through this award, I can hopefully develop a better idea of how we can use the power of the law to create spaces for climate justice on the national and international levels and make unnecessary environmental degradation a thing of the past. Thank you. Once again, congratulations to all award winners. You are all very deserving and we can't wait to see what we can achieve together. We will now be having two panel discussion sessions to get to know our winners better. The first panel uh, consists of Ko Chu Sian, Yasser Amin, Heng Li Seng, and Pamela Lo, and will be moderated by Ms. Geraldine Chin, Country Director of Conservation International Singapore. The second panel consists of Ng Li Kiang, Robert Nasri, and Sam Su Shin, and will be moderated by Ms. Frances Lo, Senior Program Manager of Conservation International Singapore. For the first panel discussion, we would like to invite Chusian, Yasser, Lee Singh, and Pamela, and Geraldine uh, on stage, please. <laughs> Geraldine, the floor is all yours. Yeah. 
Thanks, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. I'm Geraldine, Singapore Country Director for Conservation International. So, you know, when we were looking at all the applications, um, the team at CI was thinking, what were we doing between the ages of 18 to 35? You guys have done such amazing work. You've achieved so much despite your youth that we're all very inspired and impressed. So I'm happy to be moderating this session with these young, outstanding individuals here. We've got Chu Xian, Pamela, Yesa, and uh, Li Sing, who are really advocating for reducing and minimization of waste, uh, which, as you all know, is a big challenge here in Singapore. So I'll invite all of you uh, in turn to give a short uh, introduction of yourselves, your work, and uh, why it matters. Hi everyone, um, I am very honoured to be part of the 10 for Zero Award. So my name is Trucian and what I do is um, I founded Megoria. Uh, what we do at Megoria is recycle unrecyclable plastic waste, divert them from incineration in Singapore to build roads with this new material that we create. So apart from that, we are also very active within the schools as well as community in terms of environmental literacy programs. Thank you. Emma? Hello. Okay. Yeah, hi everyone. I just wanted a quick show of hands. How many of you know what a tinkat is? Great. Uh, so before there was plastic pollution, people used to use tinkats, uh, and that's when I founded tinkats uh, back in school to actually work with the campus on reducing uh, single-use disposables. Uh, so since, since then, I've gone on to work with food tech startups, uh, through dots to reduce food loss, uh, and as well as trying to create like, revenue streams uh, as we advocate for recycling. Uh, and also most recently, uh, uh, with a team in the NUS who's working on reducing fresh produce loss. Yeah, so working on various projects in, in relation to uh, reducing wastage. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, so my work started a lot in um, organizing weekly beach cleanup sessions, and much like it was for me, I hope that um, for others it was a platform for them to step on to to do more in sustainability and environmentalism. That's what I like to think. Um, other than that, I quickly found a passion in community organizing, bringing different organizations and individuals together, um, and to collaborate and work on bigger things. And for now, I'm on Stride as chief strategy officer, leading the team where we pivot towards um, urban waste management um, issues such as the theory. Great. Hi everyone, I'm William Millen here running an uh, operating uh, social enterprise called Green Dutch. Basically, we try to support companies and communities uh, in their sustainability engagements through activities like cleanups, workshops, talks, trails, and uh, some level of training. Hopefully, we can all move together so that we can all change the way to create a new ways in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so to kick off, I have a lot of questions for you guys, but I'll just keep them you know, short. Uh, firstly, I'd like to ask the ladies, right, Chusian and Pamela, can you tell me what inspired you to come up with the solutions that you did? Maybe Chusian, you can start first, because you know, who would have thought that you can convert plastic into raw materials? Like, can you tell us how you started this idea? So um, just a brief introduction on my family business. We were in the construction business, so traditional way of paving roads, traditional way of producing asphalt buildings. Um, when I was younger, my siblings and I, we actually uh, followed our father into a quarry in Malaysia, and we, we saw you know, it was a very beautiful, unlined quarry. So um, two, three years later, we actually went back with him, and we saw this huge crater there. And, you know, it, it is huge, and, and as a young child, you just imagine where did all this um, stone go to? So he actually told us that it was imported into Singapore and used to build the roads that we see. And I think that was really when we realised that um, for every single kilometre of road that we are using, we are actually taking from the earth itself. And we know how important road development is, so we're not saying don't build roads, but how do you build it in a more innovative way? And that is where I started in a career. Fantastic. And Pamela, the idea of Tinka, how did that yeah, so for me, my journey started when I was uh, in secondary school. We went to do a recycling activity with my neighbours, uh, and that was when I was given a toy car, a perfectly fine toy car, but I was given this at the recycling centre with a screwdriver, and I had to take off every single part of the toy car and sort plastic for plastic and metal for metal. That was when I realised that, hey, we are consuming too much, uh, we are just throwing things that are working away, and most importantly, every single resource that was mindlessly thrown into the bin actually had a second life. 
Uh, so that was when we started to be more mindful about the waste that we create and what we consume as well. Uh, and going to school, I did economics. Uh, so what really struck me to uh, found Tinkats was when I went to Germany for exchange, seeing how they tax uh, plastic bags and incentivize recycling. Coming back to Singapore, there was none of that. Feeling pretty frustrated, but like what uh, Dr. Richard said, uh, channel that, that into optimism and try to do something about it. So that was when I started working with the university administration to actually work on reducing disposable waste, uh, but then again applied by economics in it as well. Yeah, so since then I've gone on to work on various projects with different organizations, uh, mainly on business modeling and also strategies for sustainable development. Wow, that's really inspiring. The fact that you took it into action. Yeah. And yes, I'd like to ask you a question about technology because you're doing this work for Stridey, which is a mobile app, right? Um, what sorts of opportunities do you see in Singapore for this to grow? Um, so the whole idea with the Stridey app is we get people, individuals and organizations to track their impact as they are picking up the litter because it's, it's important to look back and see how much we've done individually and collectively as, an organi as organizations. And also you can multiply that by country or worldwide globally. And I think in a country like Singapore where it's, I personally think there's always a bubble where people don't understand how collective action comes together or even understand how Singapore's waste management works. I think that collective data collection is really important because it shows people what, what, what can be done when people come together just by simply going out and picking up data. So it gets people thinking more about waste management issues and waste management solutions in a place like Singapore, but regionally also where, where a lot of the effects of human action is much more apparent, that is even more important. So I think that's one way technology can, can, can come together. Yeah. Fantastic. So what would you say if I want to download the app and mm -hmm. you know, start, start working on it now? But what should I do? Yeah, so the app is free to use worldwide. It's as easy as going to a Play Store or App Store to download. Anyone in the world can create a team. Um, the idea is if we've enough people, enough communities going out there around the world, creating their own um, com striding communities using the app, uh, enough people will be out striding and, and thinking more about waste management. And that turns into more upstream solutions such as policy making or, or individual action. Um, yeah, so the app is free to use. Fantastic, thank you. And Li Sing, my question for you is, what are the major challenges you face actually as you work, you know, to pretty much to raise environmental consciousness here at Singapore? Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, to be honest, I, uh, you know, just have to break it down to do um, challenges that I'm observing. I think first and foremost, from the sustainability movement in the past, uh, it was often seen as uh, a voluntary movement. So everything that needs to be done is more more of um, hey, please do it for free, hey, please do it, you know, um, uh, with no cost at all. And I think that can be a little bit challenging when you want to try and sustain impact. Um, so I think what we have come a long way from there and to be able to consider this as uh, either as a service or even as a um, to recognize that the efforts and resources will be kind of. So that's that's one thing that I think has moved a lot. Uh, the second one right now is the fact that as you now start to pay for the engagement and stuff, we are also observing how uh, the potential risk of greenwashing coming in. The companies are saying that you know, in order for me to work with you, uh, I'd like you to be able to uh, amplify certain messages. And if those messages are not exactly correct, then I'm going to be challenged right now. So I would say that that's one way uh, that's coming along, and I wish that we were uh, able to be a little bit more mindful, be more aware of those uh, areas, and um, hopefully, as consumers ourselves, make some change from that. Okay, thank you. So now I'd like to open up to the audience, you know, for any of you have questions for any of the panelists, please feel free to raise your hands. Yes, over there, the gentleman at the back. Do you have a mic? Yes. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to all the winners. Um, it's really wonderful to see people who are engaged in the environment, especially from uh, early on. Uh, my name is Christopher. Um, I work with Mag3 Pact uh, Philanthropies. And um, uh, supporting the, the youth in the environment is very important for us and very important for our society. One question I have for you is a lot of the work you do, um, of course, is filled with passion. It's filled in a, in a specific niche. Um, but to have an oversized impact, how do you, how do you scale uh, 
what, what you're doing. And have you ever thought about working together collaboratively, some of, of the winners that are here or other organizations that, that you, you see in Singapore? How possible is a, is a collaboration between uh, organizations? And is this the only way to scale? Or what are the other ways for, that you see um, as an opportunity to scale your impact? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, scaling your impact and working collaboratively. So, any of you would like to take these questions? Yeah. Um, so, I think one of the ways we can make it more easier and welcoming for, for the uninitiated to get started is to remove as many barriers as possible. And I think with, with Stripe, it's very easy for, for anyone to download an app and use an app. But even without an app, we just tell people that hey, you don't have to go to a beach location to do a cleanup. You don't have to go into a forest to do a cleanup. All you have to do is to head into your urban environments, wherever it is, especially for a place like Singapore, because there's so much data around. And that's just one low hanging fruit that people can contribute in. And I imagine in all of our different initiatives, there are also other low hanging fruits that people can get involved in. And as for collaboration, I think in a place like Singapore, um, we. There is a sustainability bubble, like everywhere we go for sustainability events, the same people show up, the same organizations show up. And it is really very easy for people to work together. And I imagine that's a lot harder in places outside of Singapore. Um, so I think in Singapore, we, like, we should realize that the, 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 the opportunity to collaborate is much more easier. And we have been doing that um, ever since, um, the, the, how, I think in the past year and a half especially, um, after the borders being opened up and people heading out and about. I think organizations have been collaborating and we see more people on the ground. Um, just earlier on was Festival of Biodiversity at um, Hapi Pato, and that's one of the biggest biodiversity festivals in Singapore. And it was so heartwarming to see different organizations just having booths, coming together, seeing everyone. And I think that level of collaboration is just about to get more as we go. Can I just add on? Thank you very much for the question. Um, so I do recognize also to, from the work that we do, sometimes it's also precisely of the bubble that we may not be able to speak to people who are not really care, who don't really care about the environment. I think right now where I'm, where I'm learning to, um, to kind of expand the work is really to kind of speak the language of others. Um, they might not necessarily care for the environment, but they care for a certain issue or a certain cause. And I'm currently working on a project that I'm trying to work with seniors to kind of bring them out for a, a walk or for an activity. Uh, their, 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 their motivation isn't really much from the environment's point of view. Uh, their, their, their motivation is actually from uh, caring for seniors, uh, the health, and making sure that they're living an active and healthy lifestyle. And for me, I think that's also a great way for me to start working with people who are not necessarily incentivized by the, by the environmental cause. But if you could find ways to reach out to those who are caring for other work, but then speaking the language of the environment, I think that's where we can expand the work that we do collectively. Um, I think in terms of scaling of impact uh, in terms of sustainability, so one of the biggest questions that I get in terms of transforming plastic into a real construction material is so what, which industry are you in? And I always talk about straddling the waste management as well as the built environment industry. And I realized that um, by combining um, inter-industry technology, uh, we actually make the biggest impact in, in this instance because um, we have seen the amount of plastic waste that we can divert from incineration into road construction material. So I'd say that one way to really scale is to not look at industries as siloed or even solutions, but how do you actually bring them across industries such that you can scale the impact as well. Yeah. I think just adding on as well, I think focusing on similarities is one that can really help to outsize impact. Uh, so what I mean by that, uh, so currently I'm working on a project uh, with, the, with a team of research at the NUS on reducing fresh produce loss and I was tasked to go on a business trip just a few months ago to Brazil. So Singapore and Brazil, what are the similarities between these two regions which are so far away? Uh, that was when I realised that hey, the produce that we're actually working on in Southeast Asia is actually very similar to what Brazil grows. And that's when we see that there is a direct uh, similarity in terms of the problem that we're trying to tackle. And when I went to the farm and I saw the farmers and I was like, none of us will be spared from climate change. Not me, not the farmer. In fact, he will feel an outsized impact of climate change on himself. That was when I brought back this knowledge uh, back home and I realised that what we do here can actually have an outsized impact, not just in our region.
region, but as well as in other regions that are actually have more similarities with, with us than differences. And I think what we do here will not be limited to the boundaries of Singapore or APEC. Uh, it really will have impact across the world and as well as somewhere as far uh, as Brazil that we may not have expected. Yeah, so I'll say like look for similarities in collaboration uh, and also look beyond our borders and see how our solutions can scale uh, beyond just local problems. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any, any other questions? Questions from, yeah, from the audience? Thanks everyone and congratulations for winning the award. Um, so I'm just curious because all of your projects fill a gap in Singapore's sustainability journey and environmental kind of journey. Um, but in your experience, did you come across uh, new gaps uh, that maybe you identified along the way um, that you see that could be opportunities for other people to step in and fill? Thanks. New gaps as you kind of talk to people, work with communities, I'm not sure about new gaps, but I think something that I recognize more and more is the importance of businesses working with advocate groups and conservation groups. Uh, I think right now, what, we, what I observe is that I think local and global regulations are still not uh, corresponding with the science of climate change. Uh, so that definitely does not create a level playing field for sustainability businesses, for example, or businesses with solutions for climate innovations. So I think that's where as businesses come, come and innovate climate solutions, they also need to uh, pair up with uh, advocacy groups, conservation groups, to really uh, start you know, asking for more regulation so that the correct market and the correct level playing field can be created. And that's how these businesses with good climate innovations can actually scale their impact because without it, there wouldn't be a level playing field and it's really disadvantageous uh, for such innovations to take flight. Uh, I would say like that's perhaps the gap. I think gap in terms of uh, really having regulations to uh, reflect the urgency of the science uh, and in that like really incentivize more climate innovations uh, to plug the plug, plug problem space, yeah. Maybe I'll just invite one more comment if any of you have something. Yep, yeah. sure. Right. Um, so actually what what what's new, what what makes me worry is actually uh, the rising trend of AI. I'm not sure how they will play into the concept of brainwashing. Uh, I tried doing this by actually doing a presentation with uh, a group of people using AI generated photos and telling them about what I do. Now they have spot the, the, the thing itself and I realized that oh okay, um, you know if I could just use a couple of uh, images to kind of you know spoke everyone through, I wonder how organizations and others might see that too. So the gap of AI and how we tackle it would be uh, something that. Um, that's what basically makes you yes. Yes, thank you very much. So those are some trends to watch out for. Tanu, do we have time for one last question? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, it, let's say you know for your particular field uh, that you're working on, if you have unlimited resources or budget, you know like what. If you have unlimited resources, resources or budget, what would you do? Yeah, for that specific you know, like cause and you that's for your work. Yes. <laughs> oh, this is like the dream, isn't it? <laughs> so dream big if you got the chance to have a great deal of resources, what would you do? Yeah, choose Okay. So what I say for me is easier, remove all pieces of litter or marine waste, marine debris in the oceans. But I think if it's a more realistic one, uh, probably we'll try and get people out in the nature environments as much as possible to get familiar with nature environments. And number two is to be exposed to the issues that are happening in nature environments because I think a lot of people do not know. Um, so yeah, I would say that's one. Um, I'll buy out the companies that are causing climate change. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and since it's unlimited, I'll use the rest of the budget, which is unlimited as well, to end poverty. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Environment and ending poverty. I think, in terms of mine, I actually require more than unlimited resources. So what I actually require is. Um, expedited approval from the government agencies <laughs> because mine is waste management as well as road construction so I deal a lot with NEA, PUB, LTA, BCA and you know individually they are not easy to work with. Imagine if I have four of this so 
And and I do recognize, you know, why there need to be so many um in, in, in so many phases of, of bureaucracy and things like that because road infrastructure is important. Um, but I do feel that uh, in, in terms of all this, if it can be extracted, what I would love is for our material that is converted from waste to be used not just in Singapore but worldwide as well, such that the roads that we use are all green and as well as, you know, yeah, sustainable. That's great. And these things? That's your dream. <laughs> Yeah, um, sorry, I can't meet your, your, your suggestion. But I think uh, for mine, it's really more towards uh, uh, creating, uh, building communities around the region or internationally, uh, but having local partners to do the work that is coming up. Uh, the second one is really the fact that if you, uh, if you assume that climate change is really happening, you know, like to get, be able to um, leverage all the resources that we have to tackle the climate change, uh, the, uh, to make like, disasters uh, more sustainable as well, disaster management more sustainable. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have all been inspired by this group of youth leaders as I have been. Thank you all for your sharing today. Let me give them a round of applause. So, uh, for the second panel discussion, uh, we would like to invite Nikia. Sam Suchin is here now and Francis uh, up on stage as well as Nasri. Okay, great. Hi everybody and thanks for joining today's uh, panel discussion and award ceremony. Um, so my name is Francis Lok uh, and I work on environmental education and community partnerships in Conservation International in Singapore. Really happy to be here to you know speak with everyone on the panel today, Sam, Nas, as well as Nikia. Uh, we've all been at the Festival of Biodiversity this morning since 9.30 a.m. So as you can imagine, we're all really sweaty, but all also really passionate about what we do. So um, I'm going to uh, try to see if we can find out more about that. But maybe for a start, uh, it would be really great if you can maybe hear uh, a little bit of an introduction about yourself, uh, your work, but also why it matters for everyone in the audience. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lydia. Um, I actually co-founded Young of the Love together with my partner and together with our team of nature educators. We develop and deliver nature-centric programs and also, also conservation-centric programs to our local school, international school uh, curriculum. Uh, we also provide our programs over to corporate groups as well as general members of public. So in general, what we do is to bring them out of their indoor scenes and to bring them outdoors to the independent zone or even to the mangrove terrestrial area to explore our outdoor places and to really be learn to appreciate what we have in Singapore before we can motivate them to make a difference in their daily life for the better of our environment. So hi, I'm Nazri. I'm the Executive Director of the Singapore Youth Voices of Biodiversity, which is the Singapore chapter of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. That's the organization that represents youth officially at the United Nations uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that convention, it's the sister convention of the United Nations uh, Convention on Climate Change, uh, except it's biodiversity focused. Uh, for us in Singapore, we focus on biodiversity policy and outreach, so it's a bit different from a lot of the other nature groups that you might be familiar with. We work a lot with uh, people and with paper, not with plants and animals, fortunately. So uh, we're fortunate enough to work with uh, several government stakeholders on a regular basis. Uh, we attend a lot of uh, government consultations and engagements where we present the youth opinion on biodiversity and conservation issues. And we've been expanding our work uh, beyond policy to outreach as well. So we do targeted guided walk programs. So instead of just talking about the biodiversity there, because we know about the land use planning processes and what's going to happen to certain areas based on master planning procedures, we go there, we get the residents of the area to uh, come to these places and then we say, okay, this is what's going to happen to this site in 10, 20 years. This is how they're going to clear the site. What are some considerations in maintaining the vegetation or what vegetation will be lost? And uh, that kind of just makes it very real for them. And it sows the seeds for stirring the pot later on when the development becomes more concrete. Uh, we've also been branching out into education as well, uh, looking into uh, how we can 
uh, complement uh, some of the, the non-mainstream programs that we have uh, has pioneered. So we're looking more at the MOE syllabus itself. How can we uh, exploit certain uh, subtopics within the syllabus and uh, see what biodiversity related messaging we can uh, insert into the syllabus. So currently we're looking at biology and geography syllabus, but uh, we're eventually trying to get into the English and social studies syllabus, which are subjects that uh, all students have to take. They don't have a choice in that. So yeah, this is really tr trying to reach beyond the echo chamber and broaden our horizons. Hey, hi, my name is Sam. I'm so glad to be with Vicky on the panel. Whew. Okay, it's <laughs> running. Okay, so I'm a marine biologist from NUS, Tropical Marine Science Institute. So I grow corals, I put them back in the sea, and I take care of them. Okay, so uh, a lot of my work focuses on coral restoration in the region, especially in Singapore. So now, currently, I'm working on creating artificial structures. All right, so um, giving coral and marine life a home, I think it is really very um, rewarding and nice. But at the same time, we really need help to protect it even more. So that's why, you know, um, with all the first hand impact that we just in the sea, you see a lot of marine debris, you see washing machine, oh my god. So you see the first hand impact of damage and you really need um, more support than that. So that's why we want to do a lot more outreach and then we created a um, community called our Singapore Reef, where we divers to go dive and we pick up the trash. At the same time, we get to explore what beautiful treasures we have in Singapore and right in our own backyard. So from there, we have also want to create a platform for different people to work together. So we have worked with many of these youths here and then co-creating programs to really reach out to the wider public. And then as a volunteer scientist in different organizations, it's really want to bridge the gap between science, right? And it's always out there, it's always behind paywall, but how can you make it easy and fun to the mass public and for children as well. So this is something that I believe in. Thanks everyone. Uh, so sad. Was the washing machine the most ridiculous thing you saw underwater? Oh my god. Okay, that was actually the first one that inspired me that, oh, I should do something. But actually the most ridiculous one, right, is probably a whole set of barbecue items. Okay, so I'm talking about the mash tape, the mash tape, the tongs, and unfinished packet of hot dog. That's crazy. So we just dive off of what doing and this is what we see. And I think a lot of people are searching like, oh, oh, plastic comes from where? It's not ours. But if you dive down straight from the pond from the and then you see like champagne, tiger beer, it's yours, it's ours, right? Yeah, so the, I think that is more shocking. Nice, thanks. So I think the common thread here is that everyone on this panel kind of works on transformational change, right? Things that take a really long time to see the impact of. So what got you to where you are today? And like, what was your journey? Maybe I'll start first. So um, we all started because of our beginners. So a lot of nature educators, my co-founder, we are all very geeky people and in marine science especially. So for myself, it started since I was like five years old. I was just staring at a set of uh, fisher stickers and I thought they looked very similar. But the more I stared at them, the more different they look. And I realized that they are all very diverse and there's a huge biodiversity out there. And that makes me watch more marine documentary as a kid and that's how I got crazy about marine ecosystem. So my journey started over there. I always know that I wanted to do something with regards to the oceans. And when I dive more and more, I realized there's a lot of anthropogenic uh, challenges out there that actually have to be changed. And it all start uh, from every individual, all the way from like three years old, and even um, like uh, the students or even grandparents, like parents, they can actually make a difference. Every, every individual can make a difference to our oceans and to the environment in general. So it started from there upwards. So for me, uh, I started out with the zoo. I, I volunteered as a guide for the zoo. And I guess from there, I, I did a few exhibitions, a few events here and there, and I started to see a lot of other nature groups come. I was one of those people who thought that you know, Singapore has no biodiversity. The only biodiversity we have is like the snake and the nongka and the monkey and the chi. But it's through volunteering with uh, the zoo and seeing some of the native animals that they rescued and really appreciating the diversity from even just the rescues, right? And um, that sort of really changed my outlook on local biodiversity. So I started looking at uh, some of the local nature groups and I found that, okay, uh, most of the nature groups are kind of doing similar things, but uh, I found that the Singapore ecosystem of biodiversity, it's a bit more different, it's a bit more humanities focused. And I know me, I'm a science person. Uh, I want to do research when I'm done. 
So I figured, okay, why not? Uh, while I'm still a student right now, uh, I explore the humanities side of uh, conservation, uh, understanding policy and understanding what would be useful. So yeah, that's how I ended up here. Nice, thank you. I think same as Nikam, so since young, you really want to you know, go to the beach, go to the aquarium, just think like that. Hey, can we go, can we go? Yeah, and then I think the nature of Nat Geo and BC, right? The more you see, the more you want to be like them. And you realize that, oh, you can go diving. You get very close to the very animal. I think once I started it, I, oh, I cannot look back, right? So you just want to go further and further. So I think for the job in marine science, I actually got an internship to South Africa to study great white shark. And you know you chase the great white shark every day, you follow the researchers, it's like, oh, I want to be like them. And you come back to Singapore, there's no great white shark. Right? And even a shark in Singapore is it's really very hard to find. And I think frankly saying to get a job in marine science is very difficult. So when there's opening, I went with it. and it's coral. So slowly you um, understand how corals work. Without coral, there's basically nothing. Right, so I think um, fell in love after learning all the 250 names and species. Yeah, and then I think that's, that's the way to go. And 250 is only hard corals, right? <laughs> it's only hard corals! <laughs> okay, but so what's so important about corals and why do you work to restore them? Uh, okay, good question. I did that the whole morning. <laughs> okay, so coral reefs are very important because they support like food, right? Especially those along the coastal communities. They provide the seafood. I mean, these are things that you know I spent all my money traveling because I want to see all this beautiful marine life, and they also support um, a lot of marine life in terms of food shelter and all these things. So the thing is, um, on a global scale, we are losing a lot of land in terms of climate change and then human activities, and we want them to continue to have that capacity to have that ecosystem services to continue providing, right? So I think for us, Singapore especially, because of coastal development, we lost over 60% of this coral reef, and I think it's time that we have to quickly pull back before all this climate change and all this impact come and wreck them all over again. Yeah, and I think um, it's our natural heritage. This is what we have, and we really want to protect them so that our future generations can still continue to know we have coral and not learn from all their history textbooks. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so, just curious about what the biggest challenges you see are in your area of work, whether it's about nature education, um, telling people about what you do with corals, or even you know on the policy side, um, how what are the challenges of your civic participation? So, okay. okay, so I think one huge challenge I have is, you know, yes, we can do a lot of restoration, but we need help in enforcement and protection, right? So I think this is also one challenge that we face because in Singapore especially, not only we have very small land area, the marine space is very small, right? And it's very competitive. Everybody wants to use the sea space, right? You have the aquaculture industry, you have research, and then you have uh, developments, and then you have shipping. So all this are really money, and then we all want to use, and then imagine, especially during COVID, you see jet skis and you see divers at the same space. Can you It's very scary, right? So I think for safety, uh, and also for safety of us, where we use the sea, and also preservation of marine habitats, I think all this have to be integrated and really talked about, and we need more help with that. Like especially, I think zoning might help, but I don't know, that's like probably different level of policy. So this is where you come in. <laughs> so I guess for biodiversity policy, it's very, very broad because biodiversity is more than just uh, conservation and ecology. It is really an element in a lot of other things like land use planning, uh, even in finance increasingly. So uh, it, I wouldn't say there's one big problem, I'd say all of it's a big problem. <laughs> But uh, for us youths uh, in particular, I would say the main issue is capacity. So uh, we don't have the years of experience that uh, many of the other people in the nation community do. So we're usually like dependent on either our slightly older youth to teach us or our own uh, free time to go out and do research. Uh, with things like ecology that uh, we have a rel relatively good capacity for and a very good uh, system of passing down knowledge. Very easy, right? Just bring up a better wall. Everything unload. Very straightforward. But for things like uh, conservation finance, these are, there's a taxonomy out there. Well, it's not out there yet, but there's taxonomies out there for the different terms, TCFD, TNFD, uh, 
biodiversity offsetting. Uh, there's all these weird. It's almost like a completely different language, right? Because you think you know what these words mean, but at a very specific context, it means something completely different. And uh, yeah, these are one of the main challenges for us. It's really trying to build that awareness and understanding of what these issues really mean. Because if we want to tackle these issues, we cannot think do it like service level, uh, uni level understanding. But we need to go deeper. We need to understand the system as a whole if we want to exploit the gaps and holes in that system to our favor. Well, for um, young learners in area of education wise, um, I think we, we do face a lot of challenges and one of the challenges that we face is quite uh, similar to what Sam has mentioned, which is about the risk and the area. So when we try to introduce this idea of heading outdoor to the independent area to explore our biodiversity, initially to the teachers, they will have their concerns as well. And all teachers, they have um, the risk assessment to work on, which is known as the REMS as well. And it's so much easier for them to just bring their students over to the aquarium or to the zoo, where you can still see animals everywhere, but you don't have to consider about the risk that involved, like let's say wet weather, uh, heat exhaustion, etc. So we have to try our best to let them see the values of having the students to be outdoor and looking at the animals or observing them to just right at where they are at. So it is a, it's a different value that we try to introduce to them and it really takes time and effort to convince our teachers to first um, start off the programs. And thankfully, a lot of teachers over the years, they do really see the values and they come back to us every year, which we are very grateful for. And um, the second challenge that I can think of is actually oh, FOP as well. So when we try to speak to parents or individuals, members of public at shopping malls, when we reach out to them, a lot of them, they can, um, I mean, they know about climate changes, they know about everything issue, but it's not something that is very close to them, it's, it's not enough, enough. They don't feel like there's a challenge directly to them. And uh, it's a bit hard to kind of convince them to bring their, their kids, their family members or their friends to join us at intertidal walks or like nature places to really know about what we have in Singapore. So there's actually a hurdle over here to step across uh, before we can try to get them to kind of uh, so called eat the green pills or the blue pills to be convinced that you know we have a huge biodiversity over here and all these are God protecting. Before they're gone. <laughs> yeah, before they're gone. They don't even know they before they're gone. Yeah. I've definitely seen that. Um, so Nas, I'm kind of taken in by what you do in terms of like people and policy and I had a couple of chats with Carl, uh, your predecessor. Um, so I've always been impressed that Singapore Youth Voices to Biodiversity has you know, represented Singapore at big conferences around the world. Um, but can you give us an example <laughs> of how you guys have engaged government, uh, maybe on a land use issue or a nature park issue and kind of what the impact of that was in your particular so most of these government consultations are closed door so I, i'm probably not going to reveal too much but uh if i'm gonna tease you a little bit <laughs> give us the teasers <laughs> so uh last year at the end of last year uh you guys can search this up online because uh, we made an open letter so i can talk about this uh at the end of last year the government announced phase two of the cross island line and uh, this was a consultation or a development that we were not part of, we were not consulted for this. That's because the whole cross the line drama started like 10 years ago, right? You guys remember all that. So uh, they kind of followed up the nature groups who were present for that initial discussion. They didn't follow up the youth groups because we are the new kids on the block, right? Uh, so when we eventually got to see the development in like the, the EIE online, we were just like, okay, we have a lot of thoughts. So we, we got together with one of the other nature groups in Singapore, they find SG, and we came up with a joint statement on uh, the three different EIAs that were put out at the same time. We also uh, brought a whole bunch of uh, people down to Holland Plain, which is in Bukit Timah. A, a lot of them were residents in Bukit Timah. And we brought them to the area and said, like, hey, this is the freshwater marsh and that is one of the last remaining large freshwater marsh habitats in Singapore and it's going to be developed and lost because of this cross island development. We get that it's an important development and we think that you guys can still go ahead with it, but your mitigation measures need to be more appropriate or more tweaked. One of the key mitigation measures for this particular habitat was creating a new freshwater marsh from scratch. And well the original marsh took 40 years to form up. So there, there were a lot of concerns with that. And we outlined this in our open letter. 
a week later, which is completely unheard of for the government, <laughs> a week later they replied to our email and they said like, okay, let's get you guys in for a consult and we'll hear what you guys have to say. You can see her eyes coping already. <laughs> So yeah, th this, this was really big. They got us into our consult, uh, we got to meet with the contractor who will be carrying out the works and we really got to one-on-one -on -one talk to them about our concerns, about what vegetation is going to be moved over, uh, how the soil is going to be transplanted. Very, very detailed uh, questions. And they weren't treating us like kids or like youths. They were treating us as equals almost. They were genuinely seeking to understand us. And I think that shows how much they value our opinion. Great, thanks Nas. Um, so I believe we, we have opened the front. Yeah, okay, so I've got enough of questions. Uh, but does anybody from the audience have any questions for these inspiring group? Yes, please. Hi, so this is a twist on the earlier question. Um, if let's say you had a genie in the bottle that could grant each of you one wish, what do you do for your specific laws? Thanks. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> if I have a, if I have a genie, what would I want? Maybe, many wishes. <laughs> okay, so I think um, maybe more funding, maybe to support young aspiring youth to actually do what they want to do for the environment or whatever they believe in, and also you know like all this mentors to really come and help them to be bring them deeper into the issue because I see a lot of youth that are very they want to do this, they want to do that, but they don't have enough help. So in that sense, if the GD can help with a magic touch, give them all the information, that would be nice. Yeah. But. I think she summed it up pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a genie in the bottle, what would I wish for? I would wish for AI in my brain. You know, like having ChatGPT in your brain, that would be great. Like you just type in a question and then all the information comes to your brain at once. I think that will solve a lot of problems. you'll be like, everyone help me think. That's the genius problem. <laughs> so yeah. That's what I do. Okay, um, plus on my side, I feel like um, our oceans actually has very amazing, a lot of amazing chunks, but not a lot of people manage to really see that chunks of our oceans. A lot of us are just very uh, busy in our daily life, we're just working, uh, you know, and we have a lot of uh, tasks and challenges that we have in our, in our daily life that we don't really have the time and effort to, to, to head up to the oceans or to our nature environment to really appreciate them. So, uh, I mean, very documentary, uh, all these are really very great tools, but perhaps it would be amazing if, let's say, you know, you have like a sponge for uh, like a pineapple, and you can just enter the pineapple and really just observe the oceans when you are free, when you want to relax, and uh, to really to, to have everyone discover this chunk of the oceans. So, in other words, like bring our oceans much closer to the humans, and for them to be able to discover such a uh, beauty. And to really appreciate that even further. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, right, thanks. Uh, my name is Kevin, and amongst the many things that I do, I have the honor of being uh, the chairman of the board for Conservation International Asia Pacific. So, this is wonderful. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, I was thinking of a question, but before getting into that, one thing I wanted to say that is, is if the conservation future for Singapore is in the hands of yourselves and the other finalists, I think we're in a great place. The amount of energy and passion that you're coming from here is just incredible, absolutely incredible. The question I have is, and it's more for the founders, in your journey, in your startup journey, you would have faced a number of obstacles, I'm guessing. And one of the things that I'd really love to hear is maybe to share the story of some of those obstacles and how you overcame those. So for those in the audience who are thinking of doing something similar, they can maybe help to fast track you on those points and learn from some of the things that you picked up along the way. Okay, uh, just to clarify, oh, thank, you, thank you so much for the encouraging words. Um, and just to clarify on the question, will you be referring to the challenges that we face in our early days? 
and what we would have done if let's say we are able to you know, head back all the way to the front. Uh, okay, um, I think it's a very scary process right at the beginning when we first started Young Oculus and we are kind of the first uh, company to really do in the title world is bring the students out to the world to really explore uh, nature. Um, I mean, uh, I think one of the greatest challenge initially when we first started is really to try to build a community of like-minded individuals. And if let's say perhaps we can actually pay back to the past, it would definitely be great if like, let's say we can actually know what kind of organizations are out there. I probably would advise my younger self to reach out to like all these collaborators, I mean all these organizations to, to build like kind of synergy by collaborations, to bring more individuals up from a huge village to um, serve the same goal um, together. Yeah, I think perhaps that would actually help us much better in the early stage if we know about environmental things. So uh, hopefully for the younger individuals that are going to enter into environmental things, I think uh, with all our leaders over here, um, they know that they have people that they can speak to. And if let's say they would like to focus on different aspects of the work, they can actually just reach out to us and to see what kind of um, synergy that we can do. So yeah, I think that's actually one of the great benefit of this entire campaign. I think to add on, I mean like as a co-founder of a community, right? So not a business, but I think it's very lucky and it's very important to find your tribe, right? Find people who believe in what you do and we do it together. And I think of course hearing um, all the success and feelings from your seniors and that, that really helped a lot. So and some one thing is to the, the young one especially, just go and ask and talk to people. So especially if you want um, agency, so I had my dad clean up and I invited all the agencies to join me <laughs> on the boat. And then we just sail to Pulau Hantu um, and then they have nowhere to run, right? So that's when we <laughs> talk to them and then really show them all the opportunities that you are serious. Come and tell you guys and you really see what we see. So when you see all the trash that we pull up, I think that, that really opens a lot of doors. And then one thing led to another, I think, and, and also the trust that we built with different agencies and uh, communities, I think that, that really helped a lot. They keep things going. Nice, right, so thanks Kevin for the question. Okay. Okay, great. Hi, uh, Chris Frank again from Max Reese. So thank you again for all the work uh, to be so passionate uh, about uh, what you do. It's really, really quite wonderful. Uh, first of all, I must say, Nasri, thank you very much for your engagement um, for the cross line. This is really something that is so uh, personally distressing to me, um, especially that we will lose the entire turf city. The uh, high density development there, there'll be an MRT station, and really it's going to be a huge uh, loss of biodiversity. And I hope that you can do more than just one meeting with, uh, with the contractor and, and continue to push. I think it's important. Uh, my question is really about uh, how do you, first of all, is there a need? And if so, how do you grow? You've spoken about your community, you spoke about your, your tribe. And how, how do you bring more people to, uh, to engage uh, with the environment and to, to really care? Not, not just to do it because it's, a, it's an activity at school or at university, but really to, to uh, how do you develop this hunger and this passion um, and, and make it uh, sustainable for the, for, for the long term? Thank you. I, I, I'd like to address the, the first bit. Uh, Turf City, yes, you're right, the, the entire plot will go. Uh, we don't just do one, one uh, engagement. Usually different agencies have different sets of engagements and I think each development has about three, three engagements throughout time. And as much as possible, we try to push for the best possible compromise because usually there's no stopping of development at all. Turf City, I can't give you details, but I think it's going well. So you have my, my word on that. As for how uh, we grow our community, uh, for me, it's like I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, biodiversity policy is very broad, very diverse. And so we actually use that to our advantage. Most of our members are students. Uh, and we really play on that. Students, what do they need? They need help for their resume, including their CV. 
So, uh, yeah, we really say like, okay, you're learning all this stuff in school, are you applying it? No, right? So, uh, these are opportunities that you can apply it. Uh, we have these consultations with the government, we have uh, some consultations with the private sector, hopefully we get one in the future. So, we say like, okay, these are opportunities where you can apply what you've been learning in school. And it's usually individuals who are already passionate in their fields, who already have the expertise, but you know, they don't feel challenged enough by school and they need something like an outlet for them to, to really do it. So we have members from uh, the film, film industry, industry yeah, film background, uh, we have members from data analytics, from finance, and some of them are not necessarily interested in HR biodiversity, they just like a challenge. So I give them, this is an emerging problem, what are you going to do about it? And I think they really like the thrill of, you know, this is a completely new field. I get to place the trail. And yeah, for passionate individuals, I suppose that that, that feeds our passion. We have the chance to uh, speak to individuals during, uh, let's say, rituals, exhibitions, outreach programs, uh, etc. Um, I actually hear a lot of opinions in terms of the work. Um, they actually mentioned that it's very hard for them to head out to do the kind of work with our seniors who are very experienced in the field. So they say that they actually saw on um, social media that they have been to really cool places like Hanung Simakao in the Thailand area, but they don't know how to actually do that. So um, we want young doctors to be very accessible to all the young individuals out there who want to make a difference. We definitely open our doors to them to actually come in and to first start off with, let's say, the main intertidal works and to learn about the virus and biodiversity, um, the fitness that I mentioned before, you know, like to join us in the fitness class, to learn about all this uh, knowledge and um, eventually they can actually make a difference, you know, like passing their passion and as well as, uh, you know, uh, to teach, you know, rest. So the best way to learn is actually to teach, so, you know, they can actually learn and teach at the same time. Um, at the same time, like I um, mentioned earlier, I think one of a great way to uh, create a synergy is actually like to collaborate with other organizations as well. So uh, other individuals as well. So for example, um, sometimes Sam will introduce the young ones um, to us as well and say that oh I know of this uh, guy who really want to teach but doesn't have to. So we definitely welcome uh, anyone to to join us and to be out there with us and to just uh, to have new perspective of our nature and to teach. Yeah, I think it's nice because like some of us we really work as a community. It's all about teamwork, right? So let's say if I'm um, if I have people who are interested to learn more, I'll just pass to everybody. Yeah, so it's nice. So we can see vice versa, vice versa, right? So we really learn about different things. But I think if the passionate people will come to you, and then you just need to really come up with ideas, how to inspire them even more, whether they want to do their own project. Okay, so whatever you want to do, I will support you. So we will have mentors for you, we will arrange to speak to people and then you carry on that your project. But I think one challenge that I think we all have is um, you don't want to always just speak to the same people. So how do you extend your reach? So that comes in like everyone's network is kind of different. So we cross our different uh, community, you learn something new. Maybe you'll get a new volunteer. So that's something that we want to work together in the near future. Yeah. So like today, FOP, the Festival of Art is super cool because you have all the teachers. So those that you need engagement, right, just come down. There's all the teachers of different grade principal, they're all there. And if we have good lobang, right, lobang is uh, content, we'll share among the group, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, so this is how we help each other grow. And also to tap on to um, interesting places that I did outreach in Hawker Centre, I did outreach in parks, to try and even RCs, the void deck does that I'll do a presentation in Cantonese, Mandarin, and all my dialect in one hour. Oh my god, that was traumatic. But it, after that, you hear all the stories from all these people that they might not use social media to get a lot like that, the elders and then the young ones. You, you really have to come up with innovative ways how to engage them even more because they're also part of this wider community. Amazing. Cantonese, yeah. wow. wow. Ask my parents, how do you say it? Cantonese, how do you say it? Teochew. Yeah, just to be a bit more closer and connected to these this people. Yeah. Nice. All right. I think that's all the time we have for questions, but a big round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Congratulations again to all 10 Zero Award winners. And thank you very much.
to all the panelists and writers. So uh, we invite all of you here to visit uh, Sensory Odyssey if you haven't already done so. It's happening at the Art Science Museum from 27th May, that is today until 29th October this year. We have now come to the end of the 10 for 0 award ceremony. We would like to thank all of you for spending your precious weekend to attend this event. We would also like to thank the staff of Art Science Museum and Marina Bay Sands in organizing this event together with Conservation International Singapore. Once again, our heartiest congratulations to our 10 for 0 award winners. And thank you to our guest of honor for today, Dr. Rachel Jio. <laughs> from Ms. Tang, Bowsing, Curator, Public Programs at Art Science Museum. It's not really a closing note, it's a thank you note in return. Um, we are really grateful for the constellation of collaborators from Conservation International um, who have been working really closely with us across the last three months or so, I think, organizing this event um, as part of the Sensory Odyssey Opening Symposium. So, Danu, um, Dr. Jo, we have Geraldine as well, um, we have Joelle, Sonita, and um, Andrea, who couldn't be here with us today, um, a huge thank you to everyone from the CIT. And also, the museum has a strong com commitment to sustainability. And in addition to this um, partnership with um, Conservation International to drive impact and inspire positive change, we are also partnering with um, WWF to support biodiversity con uh, conservation. So as visitors contribute to the mangrove forest installation in the exhibition itself, um, Art Science Museum will work together with WWF on planting real mangrove trees um, in the Rajam Palau, um, Palawi um, Palo Delta in Sarawak, Malaysia. Um, and it's a very important habitat for the endangered Irrawaddy dolphin. Um, so please visit the exhibition and help us to um, effect real world impact. Um, I would also love to acknowledge the team of people who have been co-organizing the delivery of today's program behind the scenes, our museum services colleagues, um, Tej, Alim and Ken who have been managing the technical delivery. Um, we have Ting Lee and Reina whom you see and you felt their presence at the front of house, our videographers conclave, and also very importantly, our programs producers Jiaying and Rachel who have really been the best both of today's event. Um, finally, a wonderful thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Huge congratulations to the award winners. Um, it's a topic that is so close to our hearts and we really appreciate you making time to join us. Um, please stay safe and well and we hope to see you again at Art Science Museum. Thank you. Thank you.